Okay, hey everyone. Welcome to day two of the Madison Money Workshop, co-organized with the Bank of Canada and SAMF. Uh, thanks to the actual organizers, Yuzu, Jonathan Chu, and Randy. Uh, the same, you know, if you were here yesterday, the same rules apply today. Um, if you're in the panelists, you know, feel free to unmute during the talks to ask clarifying questions. If you're an attendee, feel free to ask any question you want in the, using the Q&A feature on Zoom. And then if you wanna ask a live question in the discussion at the end of the talk, uh, use the raised hand feature and then we can, the moderators will unmute you to allow you to ask your question live. So well, let's have a great day. Our first presenter is uh, Xingjing Zhang. Um, okay, so before I start, uh, let me just uh, say, uh, Happy New Year to all the Chinese in the audience, because right now it's 11.30 in the Chinese New Year Eve uh, in China. And when I finish the presentation, it will be the beginning of the New Year. So uh, yeah, thank you for coming and Happy New Year. Um, all right, so uh, the paper I'm gonna present is called Safe Assets as Collateral Multiplier. It's a joint work with Emery Osnoran and Kathy Yuan. Um, so the, the paper is about sort of a, we think a potentially new role of safe assets. A conventional, so it's kind of closely related to a conventional role of safe assets or uh, money, which is to act uh, directly as a medium of exchange. And what we think is potentially a new role of safe assets in an illiquid kind of illiquid financial market is that it doesn't just directly act um, as mean of exchange, but it also facilitates the creation of other types of mean of exchange, say collateral backed uh, mean of exchange. So imagine, uh, think about the, the we are looking That's at- That's a clarifying question. question right up front. Yeah. Are you gonna define safe? Does it just mean low risk or does it mean something else? It just means no, no risk. Uh, yeah, just uh, constant uh, payments. Actually, today we there's other notions of safety which are related, like some Rashtos work. Assets could be, say, counterfeit or there's private information about them. So safe there would be informationally insensitive, perhaps, but you just mean less risk. Um, so we mean if it's perfectly safe, it's uh, automatically information insensitive. But when we talk about risky assets, um, there are potentially two types of risky assets. The risky asset uh, that is not only risky, but also sensitive to information and risky asset that is not sensitive to information. Um, at the end of my talk, I'm, I'm gonna introduce uh, say risky, but information insensitive assets. Uh, right now, uh, we, we're focusing on an economy with just two types of assets, uh, safe assets that is also information sensitive and risky, but also information sensitive assets. And then, um, so imagine we're looking at say a commercial banking sector and the pro like this media exchange we'll be talking about is kind of the deposit contract created by uh, the banking sector. Uh, if we're talking about the shadow banking sector then the media exchange we have in mind will be similar to a repo contract. Then uh, those media exchange is gonna be backed uh, by collateral assets. In an economy with multiple types of collateral assets like the safe asset and risky uh, lemons asset. Uh, this uh, private mean of exchange is gonna be backed by a portfolio of safe assets and uh, risky lemons assets. Um, obviously this, uh, the amount of deposit contract uh, it, that can be issued is gonna be increasing in safe assets and uh, lemons assets, at least weekly. And what we mean by collateral multiplier effect is that by increasing the supply of safe assets in the economy, it not only increases directly uh, the amount of safe, uh, you know, private IOUs because uh, of this, uh, this term, but also uh, increasing safe asset reduces uh, the illiquidity of those uh, lemons assets. So when we inc marginally increasing, uh, increasing, uh, increase one unit of uh, safe asset, the, the maximum amount of so the deposit that can be created is more than one unit. And that's what we mean by uh, sort of collateral multiplier effect. 
another sort of uh, notion of collateral multiplier effect is that when we endogenize uh, the supply of uh, risky assets, uh, increasing safe assets also, incre also uh, encourages uh, or increases the return of creating risky assets. Okay, so that, that's uh, what uh, sort of this collateral multiplier effect channel we're, we're gonna uh, uh, talk about. And to study this, uh, this channel of collateral multiplier effect, uh, we're gonna take uh, the approach of uh, designing the assets, uh, the balance sheet of the intermediary. So here is a balance sheet of a typical intermediary. Uh, on its asset side, the intermediary might hold some safe asset like uh, treasury bonds, uh, reserves, uh, CBDC, then it may hold some other uh, loans that it creates. The loans are not only risky, but also subject to uh, the bank's own uh, private information. So the risky asset is uh, also sensitive to information. That's why I, I labeled this asset as a yellow, uh, in a yellow color, because it's potentially a lemons asset. Then on its liability side, the bank will put, uh, have some deposit contract that we can think uh, we can potentially use as medium of exchange, then uh, some other uh, illiquid IOU that doesn't uh, circulate as medium of exchange that we call, say, equity. Uh, the approach we take here uh, in the model is that we're going to allow the bank to choose optimally not only the portfolio of its asset side, the composition or the amount of safe and risky asset, but also design optimally its liability side in terms of how much, uh, you know, uh, those. Uh, deposit contract they're going to create given a fixed portfolio of safe and risky asset. And the collateral multiplier effect illustrated in this balance sheet is that increasing safe asset does directly increase the amount of liquid IOUs that can be circulated as medium exchange, but it has an indirect effect uh, that also increases the liquidity of its liability side. That's to kind of increase uh, sort of the uh, partial liquidity of its uh, information sensitive risky asset. Then because the IOU is backed by both safe and risky asset, it indirectly also increases uh, the, uh, the, the amount of liquid IOU the bank can issue. And by joint design, we mean that the bank would choose optimally the uh, this composition of safe and risky on its asset side and the liability structure in terms of uh, the liquid and illiquid IOUs. Okay. Um, now, at the risk of, so the, because I might very likely skip uh, some, some of the, the papers uh, that that been, uh, so, uh, you know, related papers, I'm not going to do a comprehensive literature review. I'm going to just, uh, do, you know, refer you to the paper uh, about the literature review. And uh, there are a few papers that are very closely related to what we do. And I'll mention those papers uh, when we uh, reach uh, those points. Now. Uh, uh, the model environment, are we going to, uh, just to focus on this collateral multiplier channel, we're going to just look at the static economy. We can th you can think of the static economy as a stage game in a Lagos right uh, model. Uh, there will be a day and a night, just a two subperiods. Then in, in this economy, there is a perishable uh, consumption good. You can think of it that as a general consumption good in Lagos right model. Um, and there will be, there'll be, in the benchmark, two types of assets. Uh, safe asset and risky information sensitive assets. Uh, there are two types of agents that we call borrower or banker. These are like um, the consumer in August right model. Uh, the second type of the invest is the investor or we call worker. These are like the sellers in August right model. So the, the investor or worker will supply these goods that we call labor that the banker or borrower wants. Um, and they can supply these goods at the const, at a constant marginal cost of production uh, one. Um, both workers and uh, the uh, or investor and, and the borrower uh, are a risk neutral. Uh, if they consume C units of uh, this perishable uh, numeric good, they get just C units of utility. And the reason why there's gain from trade in this economy is that uh, the borrower has a productive technology. That's like this consumption technology or, um, yeah, the, uh, sorry, the consumption of uh, DM, DM goods in Lagos right model. And the labor here is like the DM goods in Lagos right model. Now, this technology is productive 
in the sense that but, uh, the technology uh, transforms, say, H units of labor uh, supplied by the worker into Z times H units of uh, out, uh, this uh, numeric goods, and Z uh, is greater than one. So this technology is uh, the source of gain from trade and it's productive. But this technology needs financing because the production is not synchronous. Uh, the input of labor has to be put in uh, in the morning and the output only, uh, is only generated in the evening. And the output is also not pledgeable. That's why uh, the, the, the banker or the borrower needs some other sort of security to circulate as a medium of exchange in exchange for those labor supplied by the worker. Now, because the worker has constant marginal cost of production, one, and we, we're gonna just look at a simple market structure where uh, you know, there is a competitive labor market and the real wage in this competitive market is just equal to the marginal cost of uh, supply and labor, one. Now, what is interesting in this model, so you can see, see that it's kind of very similar to a, a stage game in a Lagos right model. Uh, what's gonna be interesting is uh, kind of what circulates as a mean exchange. Um, so here, the borrower will uh, issue some mean exchange in exchange for labor, uh, basically to pay the worker the competitive wage. Uh, to talk about the mean exchange, we're gonna look at first, uh, you know, the information friction behind the, uh, the asset portfolio. And then we're gonna look at the security uh, backed by those assets. Then we're gonna summarize the model by looking at a timeline. Now, uh, the, the risky asset, uh, as I said, is information sensitive. It's risky because the, risky, uh, the asset is gonna pay some random uh, dividend S that's, uh, uh, that's distributed in a continuous, uh, on an interval in a con uh, following a continuous distribution. Then it's information sensitive because the borrower observes a private signal or the quality of the, uh, the risky asset. And the borrower observed the signal in the morning before he decides whether to exchange uh, securities for labor. And if the signal is high or uh, the quality is good high, uh, then uh, the, the dividend payment is gonna follow a good distribution FH. If the signal is low, uh, the dividend is gonna follow a bad distribution FL. The probability that the signal is of low quality is lambda. And in the beginning of the game, uh, we assume that the borrower can create, uh, say, the safe uh, risky asset uh, by paying a, const, uh, paying a convex cost, CA. Uh, you can think of the borrower as a conglomerate of, say, depositors and the bankers. Uh, the depositors, uh, bankers jointly create some, uh, you know, jointly get some funding and uh, supply those funding to uh, some entrepreneurs and the loans of those uh, lend to those entrepreneurs are like uh, those risky but information sensitive uh, assets. In addition- uh, the Sorry, Shang Shang, can, can I just yeah. ask, I think I just got a little bit lost for a second. What's the connection between the risk in the borrower's technology and the risk in this asset? Uh, there's no direct connection. So the, the, this, this technology is separate from like this technology creating safe and risky assets. Um, in the beginning of the game, uh, the bank will create a portfolio of safe and risky assets using, using you know, these technology. After that, they might decide to exchange securities backed by these, secu uh, these assets for labor uh, in, like to, to start this additional productive technology. Okay. I'm mean? just trying to mess with, I mean, I think in the real world, the reason that a bank securities or bank equity is risky, we think about it because is, is that you know, the bank's making risky investments. So you sort of cut that in half and, and separated those two sources of risk. I mean, it's okay, I so, just wanna- So the, the, the bank makes risky <clears throat> investments is exactly in this part, that's like the bank loan. And then what we mean, so this technology is not kind of directly uh, about the, 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 the investment of the bank. Instead, it's like the depositors may want to circulate the deposit contract in exchange for something that they, they value. So that, that's really what, what this Z technology is about. It's like, so uh, that's why I say, you know, this is like the DM, uh, sort of the exchange in the DM mm -hmm. day market in the uh, decentralized market in, in Lagos Right model. It's like, it circulates right. the deposit as a new exchange. Yeah. All right, thanks. 
So an alternative uh, to assets the bank can, uh, the borrower can invest in is the safe asset. Safe asset is going to pay constant payment across all uh, payoff relevant state S. Um, and uh, the cost of creating safe asset, uh, uh, creating M units of safe assets is kappa times M. So kappa is potentially, if, when we extend the model to a dynamic environment, it can be connected to uh, monetary policy. Um, say when, when inflation is high, the kappa will be higher. When the interest rate on reserve is higher, then the kappa will be lower. So, but, uh, so here, just take that as just a, a cost. Okay, so now these are the portfolio choice of the bank. Now, as we said, we're going to talk about the, the design of the asset liability of the bank of the borrower. Now, what about the liability side? By designing the liability side, we mean that the borrower can issue securities backed by its asset side, the portfolio of safe and risky assets. Uh, the, the security um, is asset backed, so the security just represents claims over some a slice of those payments of the asset portfolio. When the risky asset pays S uh, and the bank holds A units of risky asset and M units of safe asset, so uh, the security in that state will, will be a claim over say a part of uh, this total payment of the asset side. And what we mean by security design is really just a selection of those securities. Uh, that's backed by the asset. And the de design is going to be feasible if uh, the total payment of uh, this selection of uh, this, uh, security Y uh, does not exceed the total payment of the bank's asset portfolio uh, state by state. Then uh, to illustrate the intuition of the model, we're going to uh, sort of look at a simpler case where the bank just first designed its asset side. In that case, the liability side is very simple. The, the bank just designs, the liability side is like a pass-through pass security. Uh, the, the bank just issue a security on its liability side. There's a claim over the total value of its asset side. And that's the pass-through security. So then the bank only choose a portfolio of A and M. So it's just an optimal choice of the asset side. Um, and then we're gonna, uh, at the last part of the uh, presentation, I'm gonna look at to allow the bank to issue, to design uh, a richer, uh, liability structure. And there we're going to allow any kind of um, security as long as the payment of the security is increasing uh, in the value uh, the payment of the asset portfolio. So that's the liability design. Now let me uh, just uh, just summarize the model. Yeah. Um, you know, if you were taking a mechanism design approach, you might build the frictions in, maybe including information, to find the best allocations that you could first and then try to think of supporting that with a market structure or security design. You, you're kind of starting with the security design yet it's restricted. Um, on that? It's more for presentation. Um, I, uh, I, I agree, yes. Um, we, we can, yeah, I mean, when, when we allow the general security structure, that's like, well, in, in this economy, the first best it is uh, I mean, so yeah, let me, let me, so uh, in this economy, the first best is simple. The first best is to allow the borrower to get infinite supply of uh, labor from the worker to create infinite amounts of uh, outputs from this technology. But that's not feasible because of limited commitments of the borrower. Then the, um, the, yeah, the maximum amount of liquidity that can be generated will depend on the, so the, to support uh, the purchase of labor depends on the value of the collateral asset. Um, but I, I don't know if that completely answers your question. Um, but, but I agree, yeah. I mean, we're gonna, we want to talk about the optimal security design um, subject to the information friction. Um, I, I start from this case just to streamline presentation to show the economics, but- uh, Okay. Economics, yeah. Now, the, let me summarize the model by looking at a timeline. So that, um, in the beginning of the game, the borrower designs its uh, balance sheet by choosing an optimal portfolio on its asset side and uh, choose uh, the liability uh, structure optimally. Uh, the, on the liability side will be uh, different types of securities. After that, information friction kicks in. Uh, the borrower observes the quality of the underlying asset that affects the value of those securities. 
and then uh, they decide whether to exchange those security uh, for labor from the competitive labor market. If they think the, the security is too valuable than the market price of the security, they may not want to do that. That's uh, where the market might break down. But if the borrower exchange decides to exchange the security for labor, then the production using this sort of um, um, uh, limited, so this Z technology takes place. Um, then at the end of the game is a settlement stage where the output of this Z technology is delivered, security is paid. Okay, so the information friction takes place uh, in the labor market. So imagine the borrower issues uh, multiple types of security that we call say Y1 and YN. Um, here, we assume that each investor or worker uh, is, can only accept one, can only go to say one submarket where a particular security is circulated. Uh, the markets for different securities are segmented, meaning whether, uh, you know, they, if they decide to accept security, uh, security one, they won't uh, be able to observe whether security N is circulated or not. There's no spillover information across different submarkets. Um, and, uh, and, and because in this stage, uh, the borrower's decision uh, in terms of whether to exchange the, uh, the security for uh, the labor supply uh, depends on the value, the, their information. Information friction means that the market for the security may not be perfectly liquid. Some security may be liquid, and that's the blue security. In that case, regardless of the information, high or low, the borrower decides to exchange the security for labor. Uh, if the security is illiquid, as we'll see uh, in the next slides, then uh, the borrower will only exchange the security for labor when the, uh, the quality of the security is low. That's why the security is in yellow color. So that's the information friction. And that's, you know, if they, the borrower ex expects that some security will be liquid, some security may, may be illiquid, that's going to affect their decision or their incentive to, in terms of choosing the portfolio of the asset and designing the liability side. Okay, so that, that's the, the structure of the, the, the model. Now, let me use my last 15 minutes to uh, explain, uh, explain the, the key results of the model. Um, so to, it turns out that um, the, the, to characterize the liquidity of um, uh, the market, it depends critically on a simple, it depends simply on a sort of a, a index or summary statistics of, uh, of the property or the value of the security. Imagine we are looking at a security YJ and the value of the security uh, is EL, Y if the signal uh, that they observe in the interim period is L, is low quality, the asset is low quality and the value of the security is EH if the signal is high. Then uh, whether the market for this security is liquid or not just depends on this ratio of EL versus EH. Um, if this ratio is close to one, it means that the value of the security is not very sensitive to information. Um, then we'd imagine that the market is gonna be liquid, meaning both high and low quality security will be circulated. And it turns out uh, in this simple market structure, whether a security is liquid or not, just depends on whether this ratio R is below a parameter of the model zeta. If the ratio is above zeta, then the security is gonna be liquid. In that case, both high and low quality securities are circulated. Uh, the, the price of the security uh, paid by the sort of the, the worker uh, is just equal to the expected value of the security, lambda times the EL plus one minus lambda times EH. And the total amount of labor exchanged or with the security just equal, uh, equals the price because the security is circulated with probability one. Now, if uh, this ratio is below zeta, then uh, the security is only circulated uh, uh, when the asset is low quality. So that's what, why the price is equal to EL. And the total amount of labor exchanged using the security equals to the price times the probability lambda that the security is of low quality. So RJ in that sense is sort of uh, an index of information and sensitivity. Um, so the intuition behind that is exactly the same as in the Arkolov model. And uh, I'm, uh, so we can illustrate that using this diagram. So uh, here I'm looking at, uh, I'm plotting the reservation value of the security 
uh, for the worker and for the, the borrower. They're under complete information, say that everyone observed that security is of high quality. There's always gain from trade because the, uh, the borrower's reservation value is gonna be the value of the security discounted by the game, like the marginal product output of their technology Z. Um, this reservation value is always below the, uh, the worker's reservation value and the security in this competitive market will be circulated at this price, the, the worker's uh, reservation value. The same is true if the quality of the security is low. But now under uncertain uh, quality, the reservation value uh, for the borrower still depends on their, uh, their information, but the reservation value of the worker doesn't. It, just, it will be a weighted average of these two reservation values. So then there's a potential, uh, th there's a possibility the market might break down. In, I'm here I'm showing you the case where uh, the security is not very sensitive to information. So these two reservation values are not so far apart. As a result, so here, the reservation value of the worker is still above the reservation value of the, uh, the borrower, regardless of its, his information. So the security is liquid. But if the security is very sensitive to information, the reservation value of the, uh, the borrower when he observes a high quality signal is going to uh, be above the most optimistic reservation value of the, uh, of the worker. Then the market will break down for high quality security. And whether we are in this scenario or in the previous scenario, as we said, only depends on whether the quality ratio, uh, EL over EH, is above the critical parameter value zeta. And this intuition is gonna help us understand where the collateral multiplier effect uh, comes from. So suppose we, we shut down security design uh, problem at the liability side, then the problem is kind of related to the, a problem studied by Rasha Toll and a recent paper by uh, Wang, uh, Zijian and Wang. So there, they look at a, a problem where the, the say that the consumer in the Lagos right model can sh uh, hold a portfolio of uh, safe assets and lemons asset. They can use either safe asset and lemons asset as mean of exchange. Um, the difference here is that instead of separately using uh, either safe assets or lemons asset as mean of exchange, here we are pooling uh, these two assets together and issue mean of exchange. And uh, the whole point of pooling these two assets together is actually to make sure that the liability side is gonna be completely liquid, even, completely liquid, even though the liability is backed partly by the lemons asset. So why is that the case? That's because going back, uh, that's because again, related to this diagram and this information insensitivity index. Now, without money, uh, the lemons asset will be illiquid because uh, with only lemons asset, the reservation value of the worker is gonna be below the reservation value over uh, for the high quality uh, borrower. Now, but when, when, when the bank holds some uh, safe asset, it's gonna sort of uh, push up the reservation value of uh, the buyer, oh, sorry, the, the worker, uh, because there's the additional V, uh, the, the, uh, say, suppose the, uh, the borrower pulls V units of safe asset with each unit of risky asset, then the reservation value of the, wor uh, the worker over the whole portfolio is gonna be this term, the expected value of the risky asset plus V units of safe asset. The key is that this V is not sensitive to information. So then when V is very high, naturally uh, the, the reservation value of the buyer is gonna be above the reservation value of the seller. At certain point, when we increase V from zero uh, to a certain value, uh, the reservation value of the worker is gonna be exactly equal to the reservation value of the high quality borrower. And when the cost of creating risky uh, safe asset is high, that's, exact, that's actually the optimal amount of uh, safe asset uh, the borrower would like to hold. And the whole point, again, the whole point here is for, to, for the borrower to hold any safe asset, even though, as we know, the, the return of safe asset is not very high. In that sense, uh, there's sort of, the, there's a cost, opportunity cost of holding safe asset. Uh, uh, the reason why here the bar a borrower would like to hold some safe asset is that it has a spillover effect on the liquidity of the um, illiquid asset. And um, the, they're gonna choose optimally uh, the amount of safe asset pooled together with the risky asset so that 
this information insensitivity index, uh, the relative value of a low quality portfolio versus the relative uh, versus the value of high quality portfolio is exactly equal to the threshold uh, in this information insensitivity index. Is that that? Maybe just to maybe it's a good time just to go back <clears throat> back momentarily mm -hmm. to Randy's initial question. So does it matter at all? that this safe asset is not safe or could you have a risky asset that were just information insensitive? It matters because, um, um, so it actually, it, would, would, do you mind if I, I say it actually in, in, in the very end? Because I, uh, I have sorry, a slide yeah, yeah. yeah, I didn't know, okay. No, thanks. So, so intuitively it's because, uh, so think about the value of the whole portfolio as a function of uh, uh, M and A, M as the quantity of safe asset and uh, B, uh, A as the, quantity of risky asset. This value function, uh, the total value of the portfolio is gonna be a concave function in, in M or the value of the safe asset. Now, if we replace a safe asset by a risky asset, but not information sensitive risky asset, then it's like we're replacing M, deterministic M by a random number. But now because the value is concave in M, if you replace you know, safe asset by a risky asset, Actually, there is a risk premium, uh, sort of risk premium associated with this risky asset. Um, I'm going to talk about that uh, at the end, if I have time. Actually, in Emery's discussion, he will also talk about that, uh, if I don't have time. Um, now, um, so so far we showed you that. Uh, so actually, let me let me go back uh, here. Uh, so. Going back to the motivation that we, we say that the safe asset has this role of uh, as a collateral multiplier. Uh, here, even in this model without security design, uh, the collateral multiplier effect will emerge. Actually, in, an ex in some conditions, we can show that without pooling, if we don't allow the borrower to pool safe assets with risky assets, the borrower under some condition doesn't want to hold any risky asset or any safe asset because the return of safe asset alone is not high enough and the lemons asset uh, is not liquid enough. But now if we allow the borrower to pull both safe and risky asset together to, to issue liability, uh, actually the borrower would like to hold, uh, will find it optimal to hold a portfolio of safe and risky asset. In that, in that, in that sense, when we allow the, bar, uh, the bank to hold a portfolio of safe and risky asset, it improves, it, it, like encourages the bank to hold both the safe assets and the risky asset. So that's the sense in which there is a multiply effect. Now, as Rennie said, uh, we should uh, allow the borrower to design optimally uh, its, uh, its, uh, its balance sheet, both uh, on its asset side and liability side to see what's the optimal structure. And this is kind of related to a sort of contemporaneous work by Saki Bejo and Pierre Olivier Well. When we started the paper, we didn't know that they, they have a uh, paper, but our, the difference here is that our setup is slightly uh, richer. And anyway, so th their paper is also uh, a work in progress. So the, the into, um, now here, we're gonna allow the bank to hold a portfolio of uh, safe asset and risky asset and allow the bank to also design its liability side. Now we're gonna show that uh, the bank faces a trade-off between uh, like designing its asset side by increasing the amount of safe asset per risky asset and designing its liability side by creating some illiquid IOUs uh, so as to create some, at least the rest, to allow the rest of the balance sheet to be liquid. The reason there's a trade-off is that if you look at the asset side, when a bank holds a safe asset, the return of safe asset itself is not very high. So in that sense, uh, the bank, by holding some safe asset, there is a, a sort of opportunity cost. So it's costly to hold safe asset to improve the liquidity of the whole balance sheet. Um, that, that's the cost of using safe, uh, the asset, this asset side design to improve the liquidity of the bank's balance sheet. But and look, if you look at the liability design, the liability design is basically to tranche the cash flow of the bank's uh, balance sheet, uh, the bank's asset portfolio, um, to in hope that at least part of the cash flow will be liquid. But when, when the bank tranches the cash flow, it's going to create this illiquid tranche. The illiquid tranche is kind of costly because part of the cash flow in the illiquid tranche uh, is going to not is not going to be circulated as mean of exchange. So both tranching cash flow to create debt and equity tranche and uh, a portfolio of safe and risky assets are costly. So then there so that's why there's potentially a trade-off. Uh, or, or to say 
uh, it's not trivial to allow the bank to jointly design its asset liability side because uh, both asset design, portfolio design and the liability design are uh, alternative ways to economize the cost of creating uh, liquidity for the bank, uh, creating liquid IOUs for the bank. Now, and we, we can show uh, that when a cost of creating a uh, holding money is not very high, but not very low, uh, this trade-off leads to an equilibrium, uh, an optimal balance sheet where the bank will utilize both channel. Uh, and so the bank will choose optimally uh, the amount of uh, safe asset they hold. And then given the amount of safe asset per risky asset V, the bank will design its uh, liability side optimally, meaning uh, the, they're gonna design in, a, uh, in the optimal choice, a, a debt tranche that, uh, that has an endogenous debt threshold. The debt thresh threshold here is uh, the maximum payment of that debt contract. It's gonna be a delta uh, plus V for a unit, um, pl delta plus V. And delta is sort of the debt uh, limit for the dividend part of the risky asset. Then the equity tranche, so the, the, the safe asset dip payment goes all to the uh, debt tranche because the, so this money is not information sensitive. Um, the equity tranche is just a residual cash flow from the risky asset. The key here is that V, the amount of safe asset held by the bank is gonna affect endogenous the debt threshold. And then, so I'm running out of time. Let me just uh, wrap up by showing you this, uh, this uh, equilibrium analysis. It, so remember, Kappa is the marginal cost of holding safe assets, uh, cre creating safe assets. When this cost increases, like we are in a dynamic model, if we extend it to a dynamic model, an increased Kappa will in, uh, uh, is associated with a tightening, say, of, of the monetary policy, uh, or to say the cost of holding safe asset is high, so that in equilibrium, the bank holds less uh, safe asset. When a bank holds less, less safe asset per risky asset, then the debt threshold will go down. And the leverage ratio of the bank uh, measured by, as the ratio between uh, the debt tranche over the equity tranche is gonna go down as well. Um, and uh, the bank will hold less safe asset, not uh, surprisingly. Um, and the collateral multiplier effect here uh, shows up in the marginal value of the safe asset, VA. So when Kappa is high, the bank holds less uh, safe asset. As a result, the marginal value of the risky asset also goes down. And that's because intuitively, when the bank holds less safe asset, the liquidity, the partial liquidity of the risky asset also goes down. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, anyway. So actually I didn't have time to answer Jason's question, but I think Emery will, will talk about that in his discussion, or if not, at, at the end, um, I, I will go back to that. So, but intuitively it's just because, uh, you know, the, yeah, uh, risky, so, Basically the security can be indexed on the return, can be contingent on the return of the risky asset. So then it's, a, you know, by, by introducing a risky asset, it's like introducing a random, a, a shock to the supply of uh, safe asset. Uh, because the, pay, uh, the value of the safe asset is concave, uh, uh, concave to, uh, so introducing this uncertainty to the supply of risky asset is not, is not a good idea. So, and that can be mapped to sort of some, some risk premium associated with risky but information and sensitive asset. And that's risk premium actually uh, is gonna be higher when the adverse selection in the economy is higher. So we think that's potentially interesting. Anyway, so sorry, I, I ran out of time a bit. Anyway. That's okay, thanks, Injun. Uh, so our discussant was supposed to be Bruno Sultanum, but him and his wife welcomed their daughter last night. Um, so he obviously can't be here with us. So Imri uh, kindly agreed to discuss his own paper using Bruno's slides. Um, so Emery, don't, don't be too harsh. Okay, now I'm not on mute. Okay, good. Um, oops. Uh, sorry. Okay. So um, thank you, Zach. So, um, Normally, you know, everybody says this was a pleasure to read the paper. Uh, in this case, you know, I'm one of the co-authors, so I guess I'm going to say it was a pleasure to read this discussion, uh, which I uh, which I got a few hours ago. Uh, it is actually it, it, so. Bruno made uh, uh, several um, uh, good suggestions and good points. So uh, first, uh, he talks about. Uh, 
so the, the, the paper generally. So the authors propose a model of security design based on adverse selection. Um, issuer can induce the pooling equilibrium price by combining a free risk-free uh, and risky information sensitive asset. Um, this generates a complementarity between the two for use as collateral. And this can be beneficial uh, through this um, uh, Z, uh, which is the, uh, which Bruno calls the investment opportunity, uh, uh, the return on the investment opportunity. So um, uh, I guess one thing I would uh, add here as I, as I go along is that uh, this is one part of the paper, which is uh, kind of the pooling of the two uh, assets. Uh, I think Shenzhen also kind of emphasized uh, I think the security design is also critical. So there's uh, there's the joint design of securities and the um, and the, um, uh, the the asset side. So this um, this kind of summary kind of emphasizes uh, the the uh, the asset side, but uh, but not the liability side. So I'll just say that you know there's uh, there's probably I would add uh, one more bullet point here, just uh, saying that there's also uh, this joint design. Um, so, uh, paper provides an interesting way to think about security design, and um, and Bruno emphasizes here that the relevant component of risk is the is is the risk that induces adverse selection, uh, where the security seller uh, has private information about, and he wants to talk about broader applications. Um, so. Um, um, so this is related to questions that came up during the presentation about uh, you know, risky information, sensitive versus insensitive assets and, and um, you know, what reduces adverse selection. So, um, so the key mechanism, uh, Bruno then describes the key mechanism. So there's uh, the informed agent observes the state, it's either high or low and creates a um, joint um, asset, which is uh, the, the risky plus the safe and um, safe pays one unit of consumption in every state, risky pays S units, uh, depending on the realization of the state and the, uh, the, the, the low state is worse than the high state, obviously. And, um, and whether this, uh, this pooled asset is sold in a pooling equilibrium or not depends on this ratio of uh, expectation of the asset respect to low versus high when this ratio is high, then it's sold in a pooling equilibrium. When it's low, it's sold in a separating equilibrium in a lemons market. And, um, and we can optimally choose the amount of uh, safe assets that would uh, switch the equilibrium from the lemons to the pooling. That's kind of the V star that Chengzhen uh, showed in the presentation. Now, uh, Bruno has a toy model of uh, mortgage-backed securities based on, uh, based on this setup. And so he's suggesting the following. So he says, uh, look, let's think of two assets uh, and not necessarily um, uh, neither is safe. Okay, so in fact, both of them are subject to adverse selection. So, um, so he says, suppose that these are mortgages in two cities, A and B, and their returns are negatively, uh, have a negatively correlated component and the correlate, positively correlated component. And the, Idea here is that the positive correlation is just some idiosyncratic risk, epsilon. And the negative correlation comes from the state, basically the low state for, uh, for asset A happens to be the high state for asset B. Okay, so, uh, so this is the example that he cooks up. I guess in this example, really low and high are not that meaningful because, um, because everything is completely flipped around for, uh, for B relative to A. Okay, so A is, the, uh, a is uh, S plus epsilon, B is um, minus S plus three epsilon. Okay, so um, now um, assume that uh, lambda is half. So this means that the, the low uh, and high are equally likely. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, low and high are symmetric in this example, but I don't think this, that's uh, critical. Um, now, um, uh, there's, I think this is slightly a typo actually this Y. So, uh, so what, um, what he wants to say here is that if you look at these assets in isolation, 
and this would be here one of RA. So, uh, so this ratio, when I put, instead of Y, if I put RA, uh, let's imagine that it's such that the, the, this asset itself would be sold in a lemons market. And then for RB, of course, this ratio would be turned around. So it would be expected H divided by expected L is also less than zeta. So that's also sold in a lemons market on its own. But the way this is cooked up, when you put the two together, you get actually an asset that's um, completely uh, information insensitive. In fact, this S and minus S would cancel. So it's just like an idiosyncratic risk. So there's just, this is just a risky information insensitive asset which would uh, be sold in a pooling equilibrium. So the, what this example is showing is that you can in, in fact combine two information sensitive assets to create something that's uh, less information, um, uh, less information sensitive. So, um, um, and, um, and I guess the, the interesting bit is that this pooled asset uh, actually is um, seemingly riskier than, uh, than, the, uh, than at least the asset A. Okay, so uh, security Y is riskier than security A and offers the same average return, but it will have a higher market price because, um, because uh, if, you, if it's pooled, because you know, it diversifies uh, the, the, it removes the information sensitivity of asset B. Right? So there's again this kind of complementarity uh, here. So um, so Bruno then says, uh, you know, this brings true banks have soft information on loans that can be diversified by pooling enough loans with similar characteristics. So maybe it says uh, before the crisis in 2008, banks might have been issuing risky loans that they normally uh, they normally would uh, would not just to help um, diversify the information sensitive component. Now I was uh, thinking about this. Perhaps um, the um, perhaps actually um, another interpretation is that banks were focusing too much on diversifying the epsilon, sort of the the idiosyncratic risk and not noticing that maybe by combining all these assets, they were actually creating uh, either, they were not re removing any adverse selection or maybe they were even um, making it worse in terms of adverse selection. That's, a, that's, a, that's an alternative kind of way of thinking about it. That, um, that, uh, but ultimately the point here is that one has to think about uh, diversifying the information sensitive um, risk perhaps more than the, uh, the idiosyncratic uh, risk, which we typically think about. So that's, I think, a nice point that Bruno uh, makes. So, um, so I guess the other thing I took away from this is that the, um, uh, you know, in his example and in our uh, model, the, the critical thing is that uh, by pooling, you switch from a bad equilibrium to a good equilibrium. And in our model, you know, basically the, the, the safe asset that we use is actually completely uncorrelated, but, uh, but, uh, but costly. Okay, so in his model, it's like basically it's, uh, it's, it's correlated, but the cost is instead of a direct cost, there's this risk. Uh, so you, you basically, um, maybe one way to, to, to think about and, or enrich the model we could think of instead of a direct cost, also um, that uh, that you know a risk that normally you wouldn't take, you may want to uh, accept if if by combining with the information sensitive asset, you can switch the equilibrium from into the good equilibrium. So that that's so uh, that's maybe uh, uh, something we can uh, investigate a little bit. Um, uh, then the final point uh, is um, is about the security design part, where um, you know. So this is the these are the securities that Sheng Xing sh uh, showed you. You know, you put all the safe asset into the debt tranche, and then you uh, you there is a cutoff for the um, for the for the uh, for the risky. Uh, the, so there's a debt threshold. And so everything below that goes into the debt tranche, everything above that goes to the equity tranche, which is kind of standard. 
So then uh, Bruno says, well, if there is some sort of like a um, additional risk, which is uh, observable, then we would think that these trenches would be contingent on the, um, on the realization of this, uh, uh, this observed um, real risk, which, um, uh, which is kind of um, unrelated to the information sensitive part. Um, so for example, uh, says, you know, um, securities could be uh, indexed by say unemployment, uh, which if we, uh, if that's not related to, uh, so it's like that's publicly observed. So that's not, there's no private information about it. So that should be just um, uh, not included uh, in some sense in the, in the security design. I guess that depends on um, how much of that can be separated from the realization of the asset. So we see the dividend of the asset. So we have to be we have to separate, okay, this part is information sensitive, this part is sort of idiosyncratic and, and due to say the, uh, um, some, uh, some publicly observed realization of some variables like unemployment, then we could do that. Um, um, so, um, uh, and then uh, I guess one uh, important thing is taking this to, to a dynamic model. Um, uh, we will look at this paper. He mentions a paper by Abadi. Um, and um, so in the dynamic model, it's not here, but one nice thing is that we don't actually have, uh, we, we, the, the safe asset could be fiat, uh, fiat money. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's kind of, um, a nice aspect of the dynamic model, but we felt like it's like too much uh, putting all everything together in one paper. So that's, uh, that's not here. Um, and uh, Bruno finally mentions QE uh, and he says that QE can have an unintended consequence prevents low productivity firms from exiting. So what is QE here? So the, so the a policymaker could, I guess, intervene into our model to improve things by either lowering the cost of safe assets or maybe creating like a bad bank and sucking up some of the bad um, uh, bad assets from the economy and therefore lowering lambda, the probability of the low asset. So there are two different ways you can, you can um, influence this economy, either by lowering cost of safe assets, uh, for example, paying a, a higher interest on reserves or by creating like a bad bank. And, and in principle, I guess, if both of these activities are costly and the costs are convex, uh, the uh, policymaker planner may want to do a combination of the two. Um, and that's uh, probably something we, we want to uh, talk about uh, in, uh, uh, in a revision of the paper. So, well, thank you, Bruno. He says very interesting paper. Thanks for that. And that's it. That's the discussion. Great, thanks, thanks, Emory. So, Xingjing, unless you want to add anything quickly to that, otherwise we can open it up for discussion. No, I, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, great. So we can open it up now for questions. As a reminder, if you're an attendee and want to ask a question, you could you could click the raise hand button and we can unmute you. You can ask your question live. Can I I'll ask a question, I guess, since nobody's talking, I shouldn't, shouldn't yeah. think very, very interesting paper. Just one question, maybe related to uh, the question raised by uh, Randy. Uh, what, what does the uh, planner solution look like? Is it, is it, um, does it depend on uh, that information, the signal? Um, I think our, uh, yeah, I, I should have written down the planner, but, but I think the, the design, so the, the equilibrium we showed eventually is uh, constraint efficient. The first best is going to be just infinite amount of sort of uh, production using labor, because here, unlike in a standard Lagos right model, uh, there's no coverture in the marginal utility. Uh, and also I guess no what I'm, I'm trying to get at, Cheng Zeng, is just this idea, this notion of whether this information is just uh, it's just a signal or does it have some fundamental value? Kind of in the sense of the, if you recall, I don't know if you know the, the Hirschleifer paper. Um, I see. Does, does this information have any social value? Or is it just really just some information relating to the uh, conditional returns of the asset? 
because if, if, the, if, the, if the information that these individuals are receiving has no social value, uh, then the kind of optimal structures that typically arise would, uh, would want to suppress that information, basically generate a yeah. pool. I think, so the reason why we think this is a kind of uh, related to banking is related to say, uh, Gary Gorton's view of banking like banking as the bank as the creator of information insensitive security. In that sense, I think the information is, has social value because what we have in mind about the information is a, like it's intrinsic to uh, the banking business. Like in the process of making loans, uh, the bank uh, acquired knows better the quality of the loans and that might actually help them to improve uh, resource allocation. But then, um, as a byproduct of uh, this uh, loan creation business, the bank also knows more uh, about the, the quality of those loans. So, so here we're kind of looking at the second step, given say uh, in some part of the paper, we, we just take, take the supply of uh, risky or, or the loans as given. We, we think about uh, what's, the, you know, what's the, inf the effect of the information friction on uh, liquidity, but a more, sort of a complete uh, exercise would be also to talk about what Bruno said about, you say, even, you know, what's their loan creation decision. We do have the asset creation choice, but we don't have this choice of uh, quality of the loans. I, I don't, um, we, if we are, yeah. So I, I because fundamentally, I think the, the risky uh, asset is productive. It's just that, um, it's also subject to information friction. So without information friction, the risky asset is productive. They should uh, create the risky asset, but then the information friction is making it harder for them to create, the bank to create it, the, the risky asset. So I don't know if that answers the question. I think it is uh, socially valuable, but it also, the information also creates some problem. I think that's the... I mean, I don't know if it, this helps, but. I guess in, from an ex ante perspective, the bank would be better off if it could commit to not using this information. That's but exactly of course, my point. That was, yeah, that's but exactly it's very difficult right. for, for that commitment, right? So once you have that information, it's very difficult for the bank to, to commit to not using that's it true. when it's, um, you know, uh, what type of asset is going to, uh, to use as, as a security, you know? What, issue, what, what security is that it issues will depend on that information. It's very difficult for banks to commit to ignoring the information. I don't know if that's useful, but it, I mean, it's the usual problem with adverse selection, right? So it's better if we could commit to not using uh, private information. I, right, I, I, that's, that's the Hirschleifer kind of effect I was describing. I thought the issue was with respect to the parties that were uh, prepared to accept the bank paper in a secondary trade. It's also better for them not to, to know this information. So it sounds like um, um, it might be in the interest of the bank to actually, um, it might, uh, uh, to not reveal that information. Maybe not in this paper. I, it'd be interesting for me to, to find out what's different here, but that's, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Saki, do you have anything to add? Because I think it's also related to your paper with Peter. Yeah, I was um, I was trying to think what the what is the you know fundamental difference? What are the fundamental differences between the two frameworks? Um, yeah, I mean, so I think the one difference is that well, it's just minor difference, I would say. Like my understanding, in your model Z uh, is state dependent, um, right? So here we just assume it's a constant Z. But I, I think it's more of a tractability, but uh, I think the, our model, because we have a continuous uh, state space, mm -hmm. it allows us to talk about something in a, I don't know, in a more tractable way. But apart from that, I, now that I know your framework, I think it's very close. It's almost the same. So I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I was th thinking like, how do you, how would you answer David's question? In, whether um, information is a good thing or a bad thing. No, I think Emery answered it. 
the, the Emory's answer was that the optimal allocation doesn't depend on this information, that uh, if, it, if the bank could commit not to disclosing it, it would. I think my answer would be that the, there, there's a general principle, which is information is good as long as it's symmetric. No, information is good as long as it uh, has some social value. So, for example, um, you know, if I, if I can get a test that reveals that I have a disease that can be treated, this is the Hirschlei, for example, it would be socially productive for me to take that test and gather that information. But if all the test does is reveal that I'm sick and it has no implications for whether I can be treated, and this information has no social value. It might, it, in fact, it might destroy ex ante insurance markets was the Hirschleifer's point. Um, Which goes back to my, I'm gonna rephrase what I said. Information is good as long as it's symmetric. No, Hirschleifer is, is if symmetric. The, if, the, if, the, if the insurance company doesn't have information, it's not good. Because it has- Sorry, hold on, but this, in Hirschleifer, you release symmetric information and it destroys risk sharing. That's the example, right? Information destroys the ex-ante risk sharing arrangement in Hirschleifer. And it's symmetric? Yeah, if, there, if it's symmetric, there's no point to, uh, if, if, the, if, if, the, if I take a test uh, and everybody knows that I'm the sick person, it, the information is symmetric, but I, I can't see. get insurance because everybody see, knows I'm the sick I see, person. I see, I see, I see, I see. No, 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 that's a good, uh, that's a good example. Yeah, 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 I see. But so in our be... model specifically, I think it would be uh, identical if either the bank could commit to not using the information or bank could commit to revealing the information. Either one would be fine because the output would be Z times, uh, you know, the expected L lambda expected L plus or minus lambda expected H in both cases. So, um, so the problem comes from the asymmetric information. So, uh, so, uh, as long as information is uh, symmetrically held, there would be no uh, no problem, which is oh. kind of what Saki is saying. I mean, I guess it's set like that, the model. I make this comment about lots of papers, but let me make it in the extreme. If I've ever seen an application where mechanism design is not only the obvious, but the only interesting approach, it's gotta be this one. Security design, I mean, mechanism design is all about that. Uh, you, you, you say you do some of that, but why do anything else? Well, actually, I want to comment on that because um, so one of the things we found with Pierre and actually in conversation with Xing Xing is that you, you can set up a, a mechanism design problem for a planner and then find a, a decentralization. So really the two, That's you know. Right. That's you, what mechanism design is all about. With a market, I mean. With a market. Yeah, it's not interesting. The idea of um, implementability and mechanism design is kind of misguided. You find an optimal allocation and you say, can we support it as an error to brew equilibrium? Who cares? When you when you enter into financial dealings with counterparties, error to brew has nothing to do with it. These these can be decentralized by bilateral contracts potentially or all kinds of other mechanisms. So I don't think um, taking markets as given or thinking that the end goal is to write down something that looks like to brew. I don't think that's very uh, good idea. Well, what I find market, insightful is so that what? What, I, what I find insightful about the decentralization is that, you know, it's, you know, we have this idea that that in the invisible hand clears clears markets and 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 what this approach tells you. That idea. It, it is that, that you can do, you can, it's even more than clearing markets. The core. You can the do core it so efficiently is, with frictions. So I think that's I the beauty. I also understand why you want to put this paper in the broader perspective of your own work, having said that. No, I do not. I'm not, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like to do that, but I'm just, I'm just commenting on, on, on this, and this, on this property that I think is, is not, not germane to, to, to our, our, our work. It's, it's, it's out there, but I think it's something important to highlight. Again, so I think I'll have to cut off the discussion there. Uh, we're eating into Julian's time. We could continue it during the lunch break, maybe. Yeah, okay, our next fun. presenter is uh, Julian Pratt. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. You see it, right? Yes, we see it.
So, so this paper is about uh, crypto assets, but it's not about Bitcoin and it's not about uh, cryptocurrencies either. Instead, what we will study is uh, our utility tokens. Now, browsing the web, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see that uh, the definition of utility token has already made its way into the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Very surprising to me. So according to, to it, a utility token is a digital token or cryptocurrency that is issued, sorry, <laughs> it is issued in order to fund development of the cryptocurrency and that can be later used to purchase a good or service offered by the issuer of the cryptocurrency. Now, I believe that this definition is a bit um, maybe uh, too convoluted and to us, when we wrote the paper, a utility token is simply a digital unit that provides access to an online product or service. It does not have to be linked to a cryptocurrency per se, and I will give some example to that effect later on. What's true, however, and uh, as stated in the example below the definition is that utility tokens have been mostly used to finance um, and to raise funds for new projects. Now, as of today, I would say that the jury is still uh, out on whether a utility token are a viable means of fundraising. We had the um, 2017 ICO initial con offering craze, but uh, it quickly died out. And one of the main challenges uh, that people are facing in this industry is that we don't have a properly microfunded model for the fair pricing of utility tokens. If you think about them, utility tokens are like hybrid objects. On the one side, they are like equity because there is no risk of bankruptcy. And on the other side, they are like debt because they do not, they do not dilute control of the owner of other project. It's a bit like you have uh, the best of both worlds, which is of course impossible. But the main point I wanna make here is that they cannot be priced using off the shelf techniques. What we do in this paper is sidestep the corporate finance issues, which are very important and are covered in another literature and focus instead exclusively on pricing problem. What we will do is uh, outline a valuation framework that is based on fundamentals, more precisely, a dynamic model that relates the price of token to observable statistics, such as the share of tokens held by active users and the velocity of circulation of these tokens. Now, why do we care about that? Why do we think this is interesting? Currently, the market for tokens and as I said, we are looking only at a subset of the market, but this is becoming really a huge market. I don't know if you follow this uh, the evolution, but last time I checked, so last week, the size of the crypto market is was 1,200 billion, so higher than the trillion dollar cap. It's a market that is growing exponentially. And investors are actually relying on very ad hoc pricing formula. Since they don't really know how to price utility tokens, they are relying on the quantity theory of money. Now, given the audience of that seminar, I don't have to convince you that the quantity theory of money, just writing MV equal PQ is antiquated approach and uh, that we need something much better. And that's what we try to do in this paper. So what we will do is provide a um, microphone in model that rely on a token in advance constraint, which I will justify. And the result will be a model that endogenizes the velocity of circulation providing us with a first step toward my microphone pricing formula for the benchmarking of ICO, which I believe are sorely lacking at the moment in industry that, I don't know, people are really pricing tokens out of thin air. In terms of insight, we have two main messages. The general idea being that we want to clarify the condition under which tokens are valuable and uh, the trade-off of financing through uh, token sales. So the first finding is that Tokens may foster adoption, I insist may, it's not always the case, but they can foster adoption because they lower the opportunity cost of holding reserves. I will explain that mechanism in detail later on, but I can give you the gist of it right now. It's pretty intuitive actually. When you hold a token, a utility token, you're also a stakeholder of the project. So if the project grow, becomes more popular, the value of the project grows, you get some financial return. And these financial returns will compensate you for the lost interest because instead of holding the token, you could have old bonds, right? So there is some financial aspect of, of being a financial benefit of being a stakeholder in some cases, and this may foster adoption. 
The second finding is more surprising and we did not expect it actually. What we find is that tokens induce excess price volatility early on during the adoption phase. What, what we will have in the model is an early phase where the service or the token is, the service is not really used and most of the token are held by, invest, uh, by speculators. During that phase, the price will be pretty high compared to the fundamental, uh, if, um, fundamental um, utility of the project. But also you, the model predicts that the volatility of the price of the token will be much higher than that of the fundamentals. And in that sense, our model addresses two of the, mon, two of the main criticism of uh, crypto tokens. First, the valuation does not seem to reflect the low adoption rate. So I repeat, blockchain have not widely adopted, but they, the, the market is worth more than one trillion. And this is quite puzzling. And second, another criticism is that tokens and cryptocurrency exhibit extreme volatility. Now, these two features are often interpreted as a symptom of a purely speculative market, now a bubble that is uh, floating and will burst sooner or later. And uh, although there is probably some truth to that, we, I think there is an element of that, our model indicates that high valuation in spite of low adoption and extreme volatility will also be present even if tokens were priced according to their fundamental value. Hence, we believe that our model helps rationalizing the behavior of the crypto markets. That's what we observe right now, showing that it might not be as irrational or speculative as it may seem. Okay, and I will explain why this come out of the model um, later on. If you don't have any question, and in the interest of time, I will skip the relative literature and directly dive into the model. So the setup, I will start with the market, the structure of the market and the technology. Very, it's very basic, actually. We have two markets, a good market where tokens are exchanged against the platform's output. And here I want to say that it's an exclusive right. So if you don't have the token, you cannot access the output. There is only one door and to open it, you need the token, okay? You cannot pay in fiat for an over mean. And then there is a financial market where you can- Let's keep an assumption that's both extreme and kind of not good. Well, it's the case for Ethereum actually. If you're trying to price an asset and you're making this assumption that this asset is the only asset that can be used to do something. So for Ethereum, so let me give you an example. If you take Ethereum, there is no way to run a smart contract in Ethereum if you don't have Ether. That's how it works. So you can buy Ether. That, with... that, that may or may not be an outcome. I don't know the institutions, but in the contents of a model, I'd rather it were an outcome of the model and not an assumption okay, so of the model. I understand that. So it, it's not, uh, okay. So maybe it's just a descriptive uh, assumption, but it's how they are devised in most cases. So you can buy them with uh, fiat, you can buy Ether with fiat, but you cannot run any smart contract in Ethereum if you don't have Ether. There is no alternative token. There is only one door. Yeah, can I ask a question? So uh, how does this, so if the, what does it mean to have Ether to run a smart contract? Is any, any unit enough or do you need more units if the contract becomes more so complex? The cost of the contract is linked to its computational cost. Okay, so each contract has a computational um, cost, and then uh, there is a gas cost, what they call gas, which transfers the computational cost into cost in Ether. And the only way you can activate the contract is if you have Ether. And this is true for 90. Right, but that's what I mean, have Ether. So do you need more Ether to activate a more complex contract? Yes. So like, does the Ether complex, get absorbed? Yes. So. Complex means more computational time and more computational time you need, more ether you need. It's a, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, I didn't, yeah, that's exactly. And this is true for most of these projects. They really rely on this exclusive. So whether it's optimal is a mechanism design question, which actually I think is fascinating. We are not answering, we take it as given here, right? Now you have a financial market where these tokens can be bought and sold using fiat money. Right, so exchanges like Binance and they exist and uh, okay. Now we are thinking about decentralized projects. Although you could imagine that you have tokens, utility token in a centralized platform. And for instance, Facebook is thinking about it. 
they have been thinking about it for a long time, but <laughs> maybe they will join the chat. But, you know, so, but we think uh, of a decentralized world. So the output will be produced by a community and ecosystem of contributors, miners in the case of Ethereum. And these miners don't really care about the number of tokens they get. They, get, they care about the price of this token on the, the value of this token uh, and of the exchange rate. So for instance, in the case of Ether, it's, it's, it's true. So if the price of Ether, Ether goes up, you need less Ether to access the same amount of computing power because the cost of the miner is actually in real cost. It's electricity, it's people you have to pay, it's hardware you have to buy, and this cost is in fiat. So that's, that's for the market and technology. I will come back to it, but that's basically it. And now let me turn to uh, the users and their preferences. So I already talked about Ethereum. So I think it's a very good example. People want to use smart contract on uh, Ethereum and they need to use this token. Now the way we will model preferences is as follows. Ucalligraphic is the utility of a user as a function of his consumption of the service C and of the dummy variable D, where DI, where I index the user, so it's an idiosyncratic shock. And this dummy variable takes value zero with probability one minus lambda and value one with the complementary probability lambda. When D is zero, you have no use for the service in the current period and vice versa when it's one, you may get some utility from it according to the utility function small u of C. Now the timing, sorry, let me move my bar. The timing itself, in the period you have two sub period. At the beginning of the period, the good market open and the preference shock is revealed. So you know whether you want to access the service or not, or not. You want to use the smart contract, for instance, for instance. Then after this, after this period, after this, this the exchange market open on the exchange market you can refill your holding of tokens or you can sell your tokens at the market price p of t by the way there is no friction in any of this market and then so on and so forth period t plus one open now what you have to notice here that is that you carry your token holding from the previous period into the next period and that's where the token in advance constraints will bind Some notation, M is denotes token holdings. Lambda, as I said, is the probability at which the service will be needed in each period. R is the interest rate. So now we are in a deterministic world for the moment. So you can think of it as a risk-free interest rate. U of C is the utility of the user as a function of its consumption. And P is the price of the token in this external currency, which let's say is our dollars or fiat. So the utility flow of a user as a function of the price today and the price tomorrow is given by the expression below. So first you have to maximize your token holdings, M. And then uh, on top of that, in the, in the next period, you will face two situations with a probability lambda, you will need the service. And then you will decide how much you want to consume of your token. And this, so I don't know, maybe I can, yeah, I can annotate. Yeah, you see this thing, this is really, uh, the token in advance constraint in the sense that you cannot consume more than uh, the amount of token you have carried from the previous period. Okay. However, you can consume less. So if you do consume less, first you get the utility of C and then you have M minus C divided by P T plus one, which you can sell again on the exchange market in the next period. With the complementary probability one minus lambda, you don't need anything. And, uh, you would just carry the token holding in the next period. Finally, and mo most importantly, you have to subtract the opportunity of carry cost, meaning that these token holdings, instead of holding tokens, you could have invested in, uh, in bonds at the risk-free rate R. So that's really the opportunity cost of holding tokens. Now, given the audience, maybe I don't need to justify too much the token in advance constraint, but I would like to stress a couple of things, a couple of features which make us think that it's a good description of how crypto markets operate. The first one is you have to think about the type of usage that we are thinking about. So in practice, let's, for instance, for Ether, for Ethereum, many of the use cases are just 
arbitrage boats. So it's not really human using the services. It's algorithm that are roaming the, the crypto space and they are seeing arbitrage opportunities and when they see it they act and they and they trigger a smart contract now this requires an immediate very quick reaction right if you wait if you have to buy the token and come back and then trigger the smart contract it's probably too late in practice what they do is that they load the, the boats and the algorithm with a reserve of tokens so that they can react on the spot immediately. Okay, it's all automatized. So in that sense, we see that this immediacy, this very quick reaction is, is a proper description of the crypto market. The second point is that you can indeed buy token on the fly, meaning in a few seconds. And here is an example, we went to Binance and we tried to buy a token, which is called Maker, which I will describe later on because that's the one we use to calibrate the model. And if you see on Binance, which is one of the main exchange for uh, tokens, the price was 555. Now with a credit card, you could buy it. If you look at the box on the right here, you could buy it. But at the market price, you would only get 0 0.985. So meaning that they will charge you 1.5% interest rate to get the token on the spot. So there are significant transaction costs. And in order to bypass them, it makes sense to hold reserves in token. Now we push this assumption to the extreme by imposing the token in advance constraint, right? And probably a more realistic model will be one where you have like some buffer and maybe you go and buy token on the fly when needed. And we think it will be a great direction for future research. Now the point of this slide to summarize was to justify a bit this assumption because we believe that it's a good description of reality. And there is something actually quite fascinating about it because what they are doing in the crypto space is that they are adding friction. We tend to think of money as a means to lower friction, but actually they are adding friction. They are making it more friction, more complicated to trade. They could make everything in fiat if they wanted or in Bitcoin or in Ethereum, I don't know. But they don't do it because they want the tokens to be valuable. So they are basically, they use the, the design of their application to hardwire something that looks like a token in advance constraint. And why do they do that? Because it will endow their token with value. And that's basically what we will show now. So going back to the previous problem, and given our assumption, you know if you are hit by a demand shock, you know how much you want to consume. There is no uncertainty about your preferences except lambda. This is a convenient assumption because it leads to the result that you will the token in advance constraint will always bind. It will never happen. It will never happen that you carry more tokens than you will need when you want to consume. So we can set C equal to MP. We have one less control. This is now the, the problem of the user. Very easy to solve, and that gives us this law of motion for the price. As you can see, the price of the token is made of two components: capital gain and convenience yield. So the value first, well, the capital gain is a pretty self-explanatory. That's the financial gain you have from the token. So if the token appreciates your user, but while you wait, it's true that you lose, the you lose the interest rate, but you gain the appreciation in the price of the token. And probably that's why many people buy tokens, not because they want to use the service, but just because they are betting on capital gains. However, if you're a user with priority lambda, you may access the service and then you will enjoy a convenience yield positive convenience here. Now we can, it's very easy to solve for the steady state. If we, are, if we will assume that the mass of token is constant, again, this is an assumption that is pretty much in line with, what, with the practice in the market. Like most uh, projects issue a fixed um, amounts of token, they sell them in what's called an uh, initial coin offering. And they use the commitment power of blockchain to commit to that mass of token, although it's debatable whether they can actually change their mind later on. So in a world where every uh, agent is uh, symmetrical they, uh, and uh, we normalize the mass of user to one, then uh, the mass of token held by each agent has to be equal to the aggregate mass. And we get this expression for the equilibrium price, which is not particularly interesting besides the fact that you see that the mass of token is neutral. So meaning if you double the mass of token, the price of the token will be divided by two. Now, this does not mean that using tokens is 
completely neutral. If I go back to the previous equation and think about the steady state, so the capital gain is zero, we assume that the price remains constant. What you see is that you need a positive convenience yield. Okay, the convenience yield will be positive. So it, agent will en enjoy a surplus at the time they access the service. And this is because they are facing this token in advance constraint and they are losing the interest rate when they wait. This means that from the standpoint of the platform owner, demand will be lower than if it were allowed to buy the service in fiat. So by issuing token, you are actually condemning, you are actually lowering the demand, the long run demand for your uh, service. Okay, so there is a cost to using an ICO and that's the implicit cost, like rationing of your demand in the long run. Now I will turn out, we will turn to the a dynamic model and I will show that there is this cost, but there is also a benefit. So a cost in the long run, less demand, but a benefit in the short run, maybe you will get under some positive uh, um, forecast, you will get faster adoption. And to show that I need to have a dynamic model uh, with uncertainty. So what we do, so what I'm, I'm gonna do now is really enrich the model and add some dynamic. And the way we do that is by adding a demand shifter Z which captures technological progress. So now the UTT function also has Z, so well, we normalize it. So it's Z of UC1 and Z is capturing, let's say the um, technology call uh, efficiency of the platform. Notice, by the way, we have not included the network effect. They are pretty common in the platform literature. So the fact that your utility increase when you have more user, which is a, basically a reduced form for, net, for search uh, mechanisms. We don't do that because it's very well understood that if you add network effect, you actually foster early adoption and we didn't want to have too many mechanisms and focus on what is really new in, the mod, in this model, but it will be easy to add. Now the shifter Z, the demand shifter will evolve as a geometric Boolean motion. So uh, lo the logarithm of Z is basically a random walk with a trend mu and a variance sigma square. If you replace, um, if, you re if you rewrite the um, equation of our model in continuous time, you get the, um, the equation below. The first one is uh, the same thing that before, it's the value uh, the flow value for the user, but now it's function of uh, p dot and uh, not pt, pt plus one and z, obviously. So first term is uh, what you will get when you trade. The second term is uh, capital gain and the third term is um, opportunity cost. And then you have the expression of the optimal token holdings M star. We will, in order to get progressive adoption, we also need to assume that users are not homogeneous because if they are homogeneous, it's either zero or one, if everybody use the service or not. And of course, this is not realistic. So we will assume that users have different technological proficiency. Some of us are really good with computer and they're already using blockchains application and many are really lagging and they will use them maybe in five years, 10 years, maybe never. And this is captured by the parameter key I. So each user I has, uh, technological efficiency chi, which is drawn from the distribution G of chi. Now, the cost, we assume that, that you will have a fixed cost of accessing the service, which is inversely proportional to efficiency. So you access the service when the value, the flow value is higher than one divided by chi i. Okay, and that gives you naturally the user base, which is uh, the complementary CDF uh, of the flow cost. Now we have all the elements. Let me get to how we solve the model. First of all, first observation is that the appreciation rate, very important of the token, cannot exceed the, 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 the interest rate R under the risk neutral measure. Why? Because if it were higher than R, you will have investors, like pure speculators, that will find it profitable to buy the token just for speculative reason and will bid up the price until the returns fall back to R. Isn't that sort of what happens to you? Right now? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what we have. And that's the point of our model. We are able to generate that regime. Where are you saying that? So cannot exceed is a statement about equilibrium or a statement about steady state? No, no, it's not about steady state. Oh, sorry, bounce growth. So anyway, can what does cannot exceed mean? 
the rate at which the token appreciate cannot be higher than the interest rate under the risk neutral measure in any equilibrium yes because otherwise the demand is, is infinite and uh, the market doesn't clear well doesn't the current data look like look like at least uh the appreciation is higher than yeah it's under the risk neutral measure right I mean, but... actually we calibrate the model it works so we can talk about that it's another okay. risk neutral measure it's not the interest it's under the risk neutral measure obviously these uh, are of course but... extremely risky assets huh? but how high can that be okay but if it's not like this look at the equation beyond so here it's coming from the think about it if it's higher than r okay you make your 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 return i mean you make necessarily profit on your flow flow pay of the demand m star is infinite the market cannot clear that's all so from this restriction you find that there is a price above which for a given level of technology users demand cannot clear the market and here and i think it's going your way because what i'm saying is that speculators come in and the market is cleared by speculators by people that have no intention ever to use the service you see like just users demand is not enough it will not clear the market so what we get is that you have an investor regime where the price go where the appreciation rate of the token the expected appreciation rate of the token is equal to the interest rate and a, and a user regime where it's lower okay because the user don't have to be fully compensated because they enjoy, enjoy some convenience yield when they use the token now of course we have to find the trajectory of the price path in that space and and as i said when i started the, one interesting prediction of the model is that you will start in the investor regime in the speculator regime you can think of it that way we didn't want to call it that way but that's what it is people that hold the token just because they speculate on its appreciation and then at some point you will transition to the user regime i have 15 minutes right uh, uh, or less i'm not sure okay so the law of motion uh, not you have summer. like eight minutes eight minutes okay so let me accelerate so the law of motion will be depend on which regime you are so if you are in the user regime you have you have to deduce the um, convenience yield and then the appreciation and if you are in the purely speculative regime it grows like a bubble it's a bubble essentially as an interest rate now you can show reinserting the geometric bonian motion speculate uh, specification that you get a uh, to uh, ODE, okay, it's piecewise, depending on whether you're in the investor or speculator regime, and then you have two boundary conditions, one at zero, the price has to be zero, and one at infinity, where you are in a full, at the full adoption level, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I use this model and I will calibrate it on the data. It's preliminary, we're working on doing better work, but it kind of worked here. So we went, we talked to a startup, that gave us information on users' data and they have data on the wallet usage. And from this, we try to infer the share of user and the share of speculator. And here you have it. And that's for a token, which is maker. So that's a, that's a utility token for, which gives you access to the, it's a bit complicated, which gives you access to the governance of a stable coin. So Maker is the biggest stable coin in uh, Ethereum. So it's a coin that is one for one against the dollar. It's decentralized. And to buy it, you have to use Maker token. I mean, to, to create this stable coin, you have to use Maker token. Unfortunately, I don't have time. I would have like spent more, more time explaining what is Maker. It's the main application right now, the most, the most popular application in Ethereum. And what you have here is the share of user against the price. Okay, and I agree this is okay the best we could do but we managed to calibrate the model and more or less like uh, capture the shape that you we do observe in the data so more indeed users usage seems to be correlated with the price let me skip the parameters uh, in the interest of time again and here is the result so what you have according to our model is according to the latent param technological parameter you have the token price at the beginning, you are in the investor regime, and at some point, you enter the user regime. So at the beginning, it's purely speculative, but the marginal token holder is a speculator, and then it's on, it's a user. So this, this is written here. What you see 
here is the share of tokens that are held by user. At the beginning, hardly any token are held by user. And at some point, when you enter the user regime, like 80% of the user are using the services and, they are, and their demand is high enough to actually buy all the token, okay? And the velocity of circulation is increasing in the number of users. Because early on, the speculators, we are not thinking about short-term speculators. We are thinking about what they call holder, like people that hold the token. They are just holding onto the token in order to earn the interest that are paid by the token, the capital gain. And what's interesting is that, also interesting is that first you observe that the growth rate of the price is higher in the investor regime. And even more interestingly to us at least, is the volatility is higher. So the volatility in the investor regime is higher than the user regime. Why is it so? You can show, it's very easy, that the price function in the investor regime looks like this. So P upper bar, Z upper bar, is the contact point between the user and investor regime. So here, if this point is Z upper bar. It's where you contact and enter the user regime. And there is a price associated to that, which is P upper bar. Now what you can show, so you know that when you have sold the trajectory, okay? And uh, you can show that the value for the price function in the investor regime has this shape. Now what's important is, is Z to the power of beta where beta is higher than one. So the price function is convex. Now convexity obviously implies that the price will be more volatile than the underlying. And that's what we mean by excess volatility. Now the question is why do we have excess volatility? What is the rationale for that? And the rationale is that by having, ex by having a convex price function by Jensen inequality or Ito's lemma, the expected return is higher. So volatility raises the return on the price so as to induce investor to hold the token because the growth of the fundamental is not enough to attract investor. But by convexifying the price with respect to the fundamental, you raise the expected return and that attracts investor. Another way to say it is that the, the reason why we observe extreme volatility is that it's the mean for which you manage to raise the return of the token above that of the fundamental and attract early speculators. Another implication of that is that you get more adoption early on. So here what I compare is the token less economy. So if you had used fiat instead of tokens, so you have more adoption early on all right, and why do you have more adoption early on? Because users, they benefit from the financial return because the token appreciates on in expectation. Of course, it's a double-edged sword. If your project is a bad project, people will be discouraged and actually using a token will uh, accelerate the fall and uh, failure of your project. But if your project is about to be successful, successful, it will foster adoption. If I have two minutes, can I say, do I have two more minutes? I guess so. So let me say one thing about a uh, related paper by uh, Will Kong and co-authors, which is very close to ours. And I think it's interesting, especially in, the, in that seminar, because they, what they use instead of token in advance, they use token in the utility function. <laughs> I mean, that's, that we, don't, we have this, uh, the two varieties for tokens. So instead, they are, instead of having the token in advance constraint, they put directly the flow utility of the token in the utility function. And it's great, and, and we have many implications are similar, in particular the fact that token foster adoptions. However, there is one big difference is that in their model, there is no investor regime because the demand from user always clears the market because not only you earn the financial return, but you always have some utility. So it's impossible that the token brings you an interest rate of R because you have the utility, the flow utility plus the interest rate. So you will have an infinite demand. By contrast, in our model, as I explained, we have a first regime where you have a lot of speculation and a final regime where you have um, really a user regime where the token is held by users. And we believe it's in line with what you see in the market right now, mostly speculation and a lot of volatility. But I mean, this is very complementary. Huh? And also their model is probably better if you look at staking model because some token you have to stake them and they give you a flow utility. To conclude, we propose the valuation framework that is based on fundamental microphone metrics. What is interesting is that we see that the velocity of circulation change over time is positively correlated with the price. 
And this is a metric that investors are currently using and it's consistent with our model. And the thing that we found more, more surprising is that it helps. I'm not saying it rationalizes all the volatility we see, but it helps rationalizing some of the volatility and the high valuation of token early on during the adoption phase because the excess volatility raises return above their fundamental level so as to entice investors to hold tokens. Now, last slide, there is a lot to do. I think it's really a thing that is opening up and here I've listed a bunch of extensions that I think would be great to look at. And uh, the good thing, or maybe the scary thing is that they, now the, they come up with new token model every month or every uh, weeks almost and uh, research is really lagging. So I think we have a lot of work to do to understand what's going on in this uh, crypto world. Thanks, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. I have to leave. <laughs> Sorry, I have to, to stop sharing. Sorry. My discussion is Jason. There are also two looking questions. For, I, I am looking for content. the window to share. There it is, I think. All right, you see my slides, it's the right paper. Yeah. All right, so Grace, uh, thanks a lot. So um, thanks a lot to the organizers uh, for the invitation uh, to discuss this paper. Uh, Emre sort of already mocked uh, the platitudes, but the platitudes uh, certainly uh, hold true. It was really a pleasure uh, to read and to think about this paper. I had a lot of fun uh, doing so. And of course, uh, uh, I wish I could do it in Madison, but or, uh, in Ottawa, but it's good to be here anyway. So uh, just the authors start with a sort of simple motivation, which is that there's a new phenomenon, uh, which could be really economically relevant, which is platforms raise capital by issuing these utility tokens, which I think is to later be spent on the platform. And then these tokens trade in the secondary market. And that leads to sort of natural uh, questions to explore. What makes these tokens valuable in the first place? How should these tokens be priced? Right? And why do platforms choose to issue tokens as a means of financing? And to address these questions, this paper uh, presents a dynamic model of tokens that can be spent on the platform. And in my view, uh, the authors make three key assumptions, which I'll call A1, A2, and A3. So A1 is that services on the platform can be purchased only with tokens, and that's the token and advanced constraint. This only is in parentheses because I want to come back uh, to that later. What I'll call assumption A2 is that there's a fixed cost of consuming goods on the platform. So even if I value those goods, I've got to pay a fixed cost. And this is what generates limited participation in these two adoption regimes that Julian talked about. And what I'll call A3 is that the, there's a constant cost, where by cost, I mean the price of the services on the platform. By the way, I think in the paper, you say mainly services in the presentation, you maybe said goods. So services and goods are the same thing. It's the stuff that you get your yeah. to. Uh, no, no, not to complain, just to just for the audience. Okay, so, uh, and there's a constant cost in dollars. So one token is always worth P services, where what's P? P is the price of the token in dollars off the platform, the exchange. And this setup yields, uh, I'll say our four main results. Okay. R1 is the answer to the first question. Tokens are valuable because they are, can be exchanged for these services on the platform. And this, I think, follows pretty quickly from A1 because you can spend the tokens on the platform. They have value uh, for, uh, as a claim on those services. R2 is that, in the author, is that uh, tokens are priced, in the author's words, equal to the discounted surplus of the next trade. And this is something they emphasize. I think it follows from uh, dynamic consistency or even just dynamic rationale. Then R3 is this uh, result about there being two what the authors call adoption regimes. So there's one regime when there's a low value of services. So I'm gonna use this term value of services to describe uh, Z, which is, and in this low value of services regime, uh, people hoard tokens. This is their investors or speculators. 
And then there's a second regime, which happens for high Z, high value of services, in which they no longer afford. They're willing to pay the participation cost they spent. So this follows from what I think I called A2, which is there's this fixed cost of, of sort of consuming or on the platform, right? And that makes it unattractive to even go to the platform for low Z. So instead of going to the platform and consuming, you hoard the tokens and wait to spend them later when Z is higher. Right, so that's how you get into the high Z regime. And the fourth main result is that returns are convex in Z, and Julian sort of stressed the connection with volatility here. By the way, there are these two older, or older, I mean, 2006, 2003 papers by Testo and Veronese, which has a similar uh, mechanism or convexity, of, uh, convexity, which you might check out. Um, different, different. But, um, so, uh, and then this sort of the returns are convex in Z. My reading of this is that it follows from A3, but I'd like to sort of talk about it a bit more is why, so A3 remembers that there's a constant price uh, or constant amount of stuff you get in dollars for the token. So you get a quantity P, that's the exchange, uh, the value of the token in, uh, off the platform, units per token on the platform. So what does that mean? That an increase in Z is more valuable when P is high, why? Because P means you get a higher quantity, so higher service, and that's multiplied by the quantity, which is P. Okay, so those are the results. Before I launch into my comments, let me sort of try to recast the model to the extent possible in terms of asset pricing 101. So I wanted to write asset pricing 100 because that's frankly more my level, uh, but I thought rhetorically 101 was clear of what I was talking about. And this is important because Julian sort of stressed in his talk about how we sort of couldn't use off the shelf techniques to price, but I think with some assumptions, we can get uh, sort of at least three of the four main results uh, with this kind of setup. So what do I mean? So consider, uh, uh, and this is just one slide, so uh, don't miss it. So consider an asset paying a liquidating dividend delta. So what's a liquidating dividend? It's just, it pays off entirely with risk neutral probability, lambda. So then with a the risk-free rate R, what's the price? Well, this is just the fundamental theorem of asset pricing. Because there are risk neutral probabilities, we can discount at the risk-free rate. So one over one plus R, right? With probability, risk neutral probability lambda, the dividend, the asset pays off its dividend delta. And with probability one minus lambda, it doesn't pay off the dividend. So then we get P1, uh, the price tomorrow I sell in the market. And this expression captures some of the things that Julian was stressing. For example, uh, there's a term from the dividend yield and a term from the capital gain. So let's try to do the mapping to the stuff in the paper. So in the paper, remember one token pays off PT units of the service, you have P1 units of the service. So remember P1 here is a quantity. It's the amount of stuff I get on services I get on the platform in exchange for one token. And then each unit of the service has a dollar value. What's the dollar value? It's how much the services are worth in dollars, right? And, then, uh, and that's the marginal utility, of course, of the services consumed, which the authors denote by Z, the sort of value I, I talked about times this utility function U prime. And C here is the um, amount of services consumed on the platform. So, so if you're used to asset pricing, like sort of forget your aggregates and consumption. So now let's just say, what, is that, what does this imply? What's delta equal to? Well, it's the quantity of services you get times the value of services, right? Because delta, of course, is in dollars. This whole equation has to be uh, expressed in dollars. So it's P1 times Z times U prime. And now just substitute in to this price for P0 to get the key pricing equation in the paper. That's equation six in the paper. P1 over P0 is one plus R lambda Z U prime plus one minus lambda. So I think that this expression and this sort of analysis I've done already captures sort of three of the main results I stressed. It captures R1, which is the, the value of the uh, token is derived from the claim on future services. That's through the expression for the div dividend delta. It captures R2, which is that the value of the token is derived from the claim on the next trade, which is there from the sort of fundamental asset pricing equation. And I think it also captures R4, which is that the return is, and you can see this looks like sort of one over Z, this is the convex, function, and I think that's coming from the fact that the price is being multiplied into the dividend. It doesn't capture R3 about participation, but I think R3 would follow from adding a participation cost and sort of engaging more with the limited participation literature and asset pricing. So with that, let me launch into my comments. So my first comment is about the role of the token and advanced constraint. So, you know, my asset pricing 101 version does not appeal to the token and advanced constraint. Tokens are a valuable claim on services, even if you can spend cash on the platform. What does that mean? It matters that you can spend tokens on the platform, but does it matter that you can't spend cash, that you have to have tokens, that they're a necessary condition, or does it just matter that they're a necessary thing for, for consumption, or does it only matter that they're sufficient? 
So the question is, would the price be different if the platform accepted dollars as well? as And this matters because do the implications depend on the constraint on the money role of, uh, of tokens? And my suggestion is just to consider a benchmark without the constraint into the price. All right, and then sort of once you get there, and this is related to Randy's comment about what's fundamental, if the constraint, once you have the constraint, is that constraint renegotiation proof? Why wouldn't the, why doesn't the platform then sort of, if I offer the platform dollars, why don't, it doesn't accept it? All right, so my second question is what's specific to utility tokens? So you sort of pushed how we need more research on this utility tokens uh, stuff at the beginning, right? But other platforms issue claims for, that are redeemable for the goods uh, that those platforms uh, uh, make. For example, warehouse receipts are redeemable for deposited goods. These are the origins of banking in ancient Mesopotamia for grain and Egypt for grain or early modern Europe for gold and rice in, in Japan and so on. Moreover, for example, banknotes issued by specific banks in the 19th century were redeemable for deposited currency only from the issued banks. I'm sure we know about, I suspect like, you know, 20 years ago in this group, people were talking a lot about Canadian tire money and Disney dollars, but also gift cards are important. And credit card points, if you think I get points on my credit card, I can only spend those on, through the credit card. I can uh, redeem them with the, in the online platform of the credit card. I can't go and spend them in the market. There's also company script and, script and truck wages. These are things uh, that companies basically use as a mean, means of payment in kind, sometimes to exploit their workers. So my question is what makes the model specific to utility tokens? And I think it matters because it really determines the applicability of the model and the contribution relative to the literature. So my suggestion is just to engage more with the broader literature on uh, script. Okay. And uh, I guess Burdett Trejo's right is a good place to start. Uh, okay, so my third comment is about service pricing. So on here, the platform is committing to a constant price of the services in dollars. So I think it, I'd like to sort of know, is this one realistic, two feasible, or three optimal? So for me, it would have been more intuitive anyway, if, if setting the price in tokens, the constant price of tokens would have been more intuitive, sort of on the realism, I don't know what's common. Uh, on a feasibility, the commitment to the price is hard to enforce, especially since platforms are likely to be short-lived. They might not even be there in the future. And third, is it optimal? It might be better. I would have thought it would be better to set a price that was dependent on Z, the value of the services. And it matters because I think the results hinge on the token yielding a fixed quantity P, which is the price, of, uh, uh, which is the price of the token in dollars off the platform, units of the service. And the assumption I call A3. So my suggestion is to endogenize the price of services as something separate. So endogenize the price of services on the platform, right, as something separate from the price of tokens off the platform. So that was about service pricing. Let me now talk about what sort of what matters for token pricing. Because the authors really set out to do asset pricing. I and mean, I think that one of the main questions they ask is how should, and the word should is important, tokens be priced. So they model tokens based on expected future cash flows or, or so, you know, not, I call them cash flows, but they really are as service flows or sort of utility flows and future services. But from my limited understanding of the asset pricing literature, asset pricing seems now to be focused on discount rates, not on cash flows. So here's a quote from Cochrane's AFA presidential address, all price dividend variation corresponds to discount rate variations or as opposed to cash flow variation. Now, a lot of people like to quote this presidential address and then there's another set of people who mock people who quote this presidential address. I haven't sort of learned enough asset pricing to know this who. Okay, uh, so uh, my question is, is the marginal rate of substitution of services in cash, this is the U prime that matters in the paper, is that what matters for pricing of your token? Or is the marginal rate of substitution of consumption across states, this is the U prime we're used to in asset pricing. That's what the stochastic discount factor is all about that matters, okay? And, and this matters because the state of goal of the paper is to understand asset prices. And if we understand asset prices, we really have to understand the source. By the way, of course, this U prime appears sort of implicitly because you're doing risk neutral, I mean, inside of risk neutral measure. So my suggestion is therefore to explore and discuss the role of discount rates uh, as opposed to just cash flows. So my fifth comment is about interpretation and in particular I'll focus on interpretation of Lambda. I'll also talk a touch about interpretation of Z and Chi, which is, uh, I haven't talked about yet, the cost of using the platform. So the authors stress, and this is really right from the abstract, that they develop a pricing formula that is fully micro-founded. But this formula still depends on hard to enforcement, hard to interpret reduced form parameters, okay? So for example, Lambda is the probability that a user is quote, willing to consume the platform services. 
Also, I'll just tell you quickly, Z code is a demand shifter capturing technological efficiency of platform. Chi captures cost of accessing the flat platform, which are inversely proportional to technological expertise. So my question is, what is Lambda really? Can you observe elicit it or elicit it? And I would sort of like to sort of ask similar questions about Z and Chi. And why don't agents know their willingness to consume ahead of time? There's one period or even one DT in some parts of the paper in the future. And this matters because it's a key parameter characterizing the platform, which is of course necessary for pricing. So my suggestion is to explore deeper micro foundations and measurement of these parameters. My sixth comment is about a possible options market. So agents don't know whether they're willing to consume on the platform. That was the Lambda I was talking about. So agents could be, so the agents who turn out to be unwilling, they end up holding these tokens inefficiently that they don't, they're not willing to spend, so they can't spend these tokens. They're just sort of sitting there dormant. Right? And so my question is, could an options market resolve this inefficiency? Let me tell you what I have in mind. Why don't we, instead of trading the tokens themselves, trade options to buy tokens or instead maybe as well. So it's a call option. Then the willing agent, so once I learn I'm willing to consume on the platform, I exercise my option to buy, to buy the token and I use that token to consume. And know this isn't just some sort of theoretical pipe, pipe dream, you know, Bitcoin options and futures are already being traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the biggest options exchange in the world, I think. And it matters because the price of the to token is determined by the opportunity cost of not consuming, you know, even though you're willing to. And I wonder if this opportunity cost could vanish with the options market because all the willing guys would exercise their options and consume. And likewise, by the way, if agents formed a bank with diamond dig dig demand deposits, these are likewise options to consume, uh, then I think it could have the same effect. So my suggestion is to allow agents to trade more general claims, not just the tokens themselves, but also claims on these tokens. And my seventh comment is about issuance. So the okay, authors so start with a discussion. Are we of, a bit short, uh, maybe what, one minute to, to wrap up? One minute is perfect, thank you. Okay. So the authors start with a discussion of firms raising capital and they ask the question, what are the actual benefits of tokenization to the issuer? But they don't circle back much. And I think maybe, maybe I was a bit quick at the end of the paper and maybe uh, Julian did this a bit more in the presentation. My question is sort of what are the actual benefits of tokenization to the issuer? You sort of focused all on the pricing aspect and not on the issuance question. And it matters because what tokens, that's what tokens do. They help firms raise funds. It's not just how they're priced. So my suggestion is to model this issuance decision. So to conclude, I really thought it was an interesting paper. I had a great time uh, thinking about it. And um, I had some comments about the role, whether the, ne the necessity of the token advanced constraint, understanding what's specific to tokens about optimal service pricing on the platform, about what matters for token pricing off the platform, about the interpretation of Lambda and Z and Chi, about the possibility of an options market and about endogenizing the issuance decision. I hope some of them are useful. Thanks a lot. Julian, do you want to respond to Jason's comments first? So I would love to respond to all of them, but I, <laughs> fortunately, I won't be able. But okay, so there's way too much to address everything in uh, five minutes. So let I will do an unfair selection. I will pick the one I find easier to answer. But uh, I'm looking forward to receiving the slides and uh, going uh, carefully over them. And also the reference you had at some point during your talk, I'm not sure it's there, about the convexity of pricing. I'm very curious about it. Now, if I'm correct, if I understood what you said, you say, and this is a consistent uh, with Randy's comment, right? That we should not assume that the platform can only be accessed with the token. So point well taken. My justification was that it looks like this in reality, but okay, maybe reality is wrong and uh, Fury is right. So let's look at it. Uh, and we're going to do it and it's and um yeah so it, we should do that and uh, look at look at it and well there are both options now my feeling is that um they make it impossible to access for fiat in practice not because it's good in terms of um, raising the demand for your services but because they want to increase the value of the token and why they want to do that because these tokens are actually used as a mean of raising finance early on during the project. And so one way to make this token valuable is to say that it's exclusive. And it's a decision that maybe you will regret later on because it will lower the value of your project by lowering your demand, right? So that's where the corporate, corporate finance decision and pricing aspect collide. 
And this is linked, I think, to your second point about what is specific about tokens. And actually, it's, it's something we thought about. I, it's true, it's voucher. I mean, it existed. It's not that uh, now we pay attention to them because they are in blockchain, but you had similar things. But the thing which may be specific to blockchain, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that usually when you have voucher, you have voucher for things people like. You don't have voucher for things that people will like in the future. It was not used at the venture capital stage. It was used for things that were all, you know, like miles. Okay, the plan is there, you want, then you give you a voucher. Here, they are creating these tokens for projects that will probably be operational in two or three years. And this is, I believe, the specificity. But that being said, I'm, you're right. This is the you know, same economic mechanism. Now we look at this literature and I'm looking for references. We could not find really advanced dynamic pricing in that literature. It's more like empirical and so on. So, but we have to dig further and we will. It's uh, completely fair enough. And um, yes, for the other ones, I'm sorry, I forgot. I don't have much, the, com ah, the commitment. Yes, the commitment side. There is no really commitment. And that I think is where is the beauty of decentralization. Look at Ethereum. In Ethereum, there is a market for miners and they compete to provide the, the service for Ether. And it's not that the platform Ethereum is saying, oh, we have committed to exchange at that price. It's just that there is a market where miners enter and it turns out that they are only interested by the price in fiat, the real price, the real value of the token because they pay electricity, they pay hardware, they pay their people in, a, in, a, in, a, in fiat. And this is going through the decentralization of the intermediaries, but it's not really clear in the paper, in the contributors. No? Maybe we, it's too quick and uh, we should explain that much better, may, even maybe formalize it. No? But you see my point, the fact that the, the contributors don't care about the token per se, but the, the value in, a, in, in fiat, this is not coming from, from commitment, it's coming from a market for intermediaries where they can enter and live as they want. Is it answering your point or maybe not? I don't know. I mean, the picture is so small, I don't see your expression. I cannot tell if it's... Good. Thanks, thanks for the answer. Then. Okay, and uh, the rest, I will be happy uh, to discuss with you later or, and, and think about it more deeply. Julian, there's a, another question from the audience. Um, sure. From Amani Moin. Uh, I will uh, unmute him and allow him to, to ask the question, right? Yeah. Uh, Amani, are, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Um, so you mentioned when you were um, laying out the use cases for Maker and why there's demand for it, that uh, users need Maker um, to mint DAI. But initially, that was not the case, and you didn't need to hold any Maker to mint DAI, but there was still a lot of demand for it. Um, so do you see any empirical changes in how the pricing works of Maker around when, um, like, I guess the, the the format of the token changes? Uh, this is around the end of 2019. Okay, I, uh, I mean, uh, I could answer that question if I had looked at it. We didn't look at it. So we are working on the empirical, but we will definitely mm -hmm. look at it. Now I have to come clean about that. So Maker is not a pure utility token. And as you said, at the beginning, it was just a governance token. Now it's very hard to find a pure utility token because most of them are also giving you governance rights. And uh, so we are looking at, we are working on different tokens and trying to provide better empirical evidence, but that's a great uh, break in the series that, uh, yeah, we should look at that. We should, add, we should add on it, but we will do it. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. Uh, Maybe we have time for one more question, if there is one more. I mean, I can ask one just now. Yeah. Hey, Julian, how are you doing? Hi, Rico. Um, so yeah, you know, like a uh, Kickstarter, um, yeah. often like uh, you put money in and then they promise a product. So I mean, that's an alternative, right? You could just uh, sell the product in advance and then like an IOU in the product. So, I mean, do these guys, uh, the hope is what is that they will create something like a currency on top of it and get some extra revenue from that. Is that what, why? Why is it different from that simple IOU in the good? If all you want is to raise funds. I mean, again, I, mean, I think the idea was around. So where maybe it's scaled up with blockchain is that with blockchain every transaction is recorded, 
So you can, and you can commit to a contract when you launch it. So it's clear that every time you will need to access the service, you will need this IOU. You can really en you enforce this commitment if you want. Why in Kickstarter, it's coming probably for lawyers and things like this, no? Makes it bigger transaction costs. But the logic is the same, you're right. Is it, was, was it your question? I mean, yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, there's a sense in which, um, I don't know, the Kickstarter, I, it doesn't seem like they're so conscious about the secondary market for the promise. Yeah. You know, uh, exactly. while these guys, it seems to me that they're hoping that something else will happen to be able to raise more revenue because this promise does something else, you know? It, it, but uh, so, I wonder how many, yeah. So the answer we have in the model is uh, exactly early on, you have in the speculators because there is a, also, you're right, they are very fluid secondary, secondary market. That's true. That you can trade them and speculate on them. So the speculators, they come in and they raise the, the fund for the project and they kick it, you know, they kick start it. And uh, then they get rid of the stuff in the secondary market, you know, and they speculate on it. And this took a whole new dimension because it's pretty, I mean, it's a few lines of code. I mean, it's amazingly simple to create a UTT token. It's 30 lines of code, actually. Now it's completely standardized. Yeah, maybe what's different is the uncertainty about the fundamental value. Um, so when I put the Kickstarter, I was buying like a, pl a Wi-Fi plug, and it's pretty clear, you know, it's not a m much uncertainty on that. The other one, yeah, they make it big. Right. Yeah. Um, that might make a big, yeah. So they really, some... sorry, yeah. So I'm not sure that, I mean, it's the, the level of pricing is, is incredible now. So I don't know if it's how far it will be sustainable, but it's really this idea that most of this project will die, but on some of them, you, you get these massive returns, no? But really, like people get rich uh, overnight uh, in a few months, and that's how really on what they are playing. Most of these tokens they die. The majority of them, never, maybe ninety percent die, but maybe five percent have like uh, unbelievable returns. All right, so we are running out of time. Uh, so we'll conclude the first half of today's uh, workshop, and we'll reconvene in twenty three minutes at one o'clock Eastern time. And Lee and she will present her paper by then. Thank you. Um, our next talk is by Lee and she, and she will um, tell us about repurchase repurchase options in, in the market for lemons. Thanks. Uh, thanks for including this paper. This is joint work with Shaki, uh, who's also in the audience. In this paper, we start with the observation that many financial contracts are structured in a way to embed a repurchase option. For example, for repo agreements, the buyers and sellers are engaging in a two legs of transactions. Uh, first, selling the contract and then agreeing to uh, repurchase the layer if the original seller indeed honors the agreement and many other types of contracts such as collateralized debt are also essentially contracts for selling um, the assets while including an option for um, the borrower to repurchase their assets. Um, these contracts are not just modern financial innovation. Um, earlier, um, very early um, borrowing arrangements such as pawning um, are precursors to their modern equivalents. So in this paper, um, we broadly refer to contracts embedding repurchase options as repos. Uh, so the question is why repos? If I have liquidity needs, why don't I just simply sell the assets? Why do we engage in um, more involved transactions? And the fact that these contracts persist um, under different institutional environments and um, across time uh, suggests that there must be something fundamental leading to um, these uh, contracts, um, leading to repo being uh, a preferable contractual arrangement. Complementing um, many existing explanations in the literature, we argue in this paper that repo uh, emerges as a natural response to adverse selection. Uh, essentially, it's a way to resolve lemons, the rem lemons problem in markets with adverse selection by preventing markets from unraveling. 
So uh, the idea that um, um, we and the insights we will show echo on um, the idea in the security design literature that debt or um, collateralized debt is the optimal security design preferable to equity assurance. However, um, here um, we, um, instead of relying on commitment to security design extenty, uh, we show that uh, repo contract design emerges in a competitive market as a natural response to adverse selection. So to illustrate the idea that uh, the advantage of repo contracts, uh, we start with a very simple motivating example. So suppose there's a set of lenders with investment opportunity uh, yielding 20% return. And half of them have uh, low quality assets worth $40 and the other half have um, assets worth $80. So this is, um, if they were only able to sell the assets in order to raise funds for their projects, this is the standard lemons market that um, the outcome is going to be the high quality assets stay out of the market and the low quality assets sell at their value of $40. So the average fund uh, raised is going to be $20. Uh, however, if we were to introduce a repo contract, for example, uh, one repo contract could be that we uh, allow the borrowers to sell their assets at $50 and, uh, uh, and repurchase it at $60. So now the high quality assets uh, find it profitable to engage in this transaction because on the return they get from uh, the fund they raise is going to be uh, able to cover uh, what they needed to repay later. So, so the repo contract is going to yield an, an average um, uh, fund of um, $50. So it more than doubles the amount of uh, liquidity uh, the market can provide with just asset sales. So um, this example illustrates why uh, repo is advantageous to uh, asset sales. However, it's incomplete in describing the actual outcomes in the market equilibrium. In particular, which type of repo contract is going to emerge and the efficiency nature of the outcome. So um, to, uh, so much of the paper will I, be- I interrupt you here, please ask a quick question. Sure, so go ahead. There seem to be other mechanisms that would work. You know, the standard thing is I sell you a car and you might worry it's a lemon. So what if I give you a warranty? Or in other words, some transfer that can be made contingent on realization of the quality of the asset. You're going to somehow show that that's not possible or that would be equivalent or, or what? You see what I'm saying? So it's it's kind of, can we think of this as a reverse repo that? I don't know. If, um, <laughs> So, okay, so I think this is the answer. The difference here is that uh, the seller needed to be able to commit to the warrant, right? So the problem here is that they're not able to commit. Okay, that's what I was thinking, but then again, they can commit to the repurchase. It's not going to, they can, it's an option. So they can okay. potentially default on the repurchase obligation. Okay. Uh, so, to uh, study uh, the market outcome, we're going to set um, the, uh, so we're going to be in a market setting where the trade motive for, uh, for the agents are, there is a liquidity need for the borrowers. However, um, the, bar the assets are worth the same for uh, both the borrowers and the lenders. And uh, for, for the contract, it's essentially going to be a contract that sells the asset with an option to repurchase. However, it's up to 
the borrowers to decide whether they are going to exercise it or default on the option. And to circ circumvent problems that usually flag uh, the refinement of equilibrium in markets with adverse selection, we adopt the nazir and sure timing, which allows for contract withdrawal. And it's a micro foundation for the Miyazaki, Wilson, and Spence equilibrium. Uh, and as a purview, uh, the main results are going to be we obtain a unique pooling equilibrium of all assets. So uh, all quality of assets are going to find it appealing to participate in the market, therefore resolving the adverse selection problem. However, we find that um, the market outcome, despite having a uh, uh, good chance of in improving over asset sales, it's still constrained inefficient because when we enrich the contract space by allowing for the repurchase option, there is also going to be competition forces through the terms of the repurchase option that allows lenders to cream scheme high quality assets. So in comparison with on what we find as the optimal repo contract, uh, exactly resembling a security design solution, the market outcome is still inefficient. And we characterize situations that repo strictly dominates asset sales uh, by um, studying the trade-off through participation versus the screen scheming force. So uh, very briefly in relation to the literature, uh, we uh, study competitive markets with adverse selection and there has been, we build on a lot of work that focus on asset sales, including many in the audience. And just wanted to mention that on the, here, when we, we show that when we enrich the contract, uh, we improve on the market outcome. To introduce the environment, uh, the economy consists of two periods. There is no discounting and all agents are risk neutral. So there is a continuum of borrowers. Um, each of them is endowed with an indivisible asset and they have an investment project at uh, uh, the first period. In the second period, uh, the asset they own pays dividend and the investment project pays off. In particular, the assets differ in their quality, lambda, which is on um, uh, in this distribution from lambda lower bar to upper bar following uh, accumulative dis distribution function F. And uh, the project pays off, uh, uh, there is a linear payoff for the uh, for the project if they were to invest in the first period x amount of funds, then this is going to be the gross return on the project. There is a set of competitive lenders indexed by J, um, and uh, there is information asymmetry where uh, the the asset quality lambda is private information to its owner. So a repo contract in this environment specifies two prices. Um, first, um, a sales price, and then a repurchase price. Without loss of generality, we can restrict the price space, the, the contract space to this, um, to the relevant quality domain. In the first period, uh, so when the borrowers engage in this contract, they are going to uh, receive PS for selling the assets in the first period. In the next period, they can repurchase the asset at a price PR. So if we think of a collateralized debt, the ratio of the two prices is going to be the gross interest rate. And um, but the eight, we have, uh, we assume one-sided limited commitment. So the borrowers can default on their uh, obli obligation of repurchasing the asset. So essentially um, the contract is going to grant them an option to repurchase at a pre-specified price. 
and the lenders can commit. Aren't these repo contracts often, you know, they're not implicit contracts that are written down on paper and would be enforceable by the courts. So one way to default on it is to go bankrupt. But short of that, it's, aren't these typically binding agreements in the real world? So uh, they, so if if they were to default, they just lose the asset. The, the lender sees sees the asset. The borrower on the lender sees the assets. Well, I thought a lot of them were actually, as I say, legally binding contracts to repurchase. It's an institutional detail you might want to ignore. But okay. I think at least some of these are not, they don't give the borrower the option to rebuy. I mean, any right. um, it's written down. So, so for repo agreements, um, yes, I, I think I would double check the institutional details. So in thinking about a pawn shop or collateralized debt, um, there are options to default that you can just walk away and you lose your collateral. I, I agree with that and the pawn shop's a great example. But when you do these repos in, in financial markets like commercial banks do, and these things are they're not like pawn shops in my, in my guess. You have to check the facts. Okay. So, so yeah. we, we, we checked that institutional detail and what we found is that what you're saying is right, Randy. However, de facto, they're never taken to court when we did this reading. So I guess the legal expenses to collect uh, an asset that has been defaulted um, are too, exp you know, too expensive. So people just stick to the asset and they, they don't collect the, 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 you know, wherever the remainder is. Are these just called repo fails? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so here, on uh, SS sales is going to be a special case of a repo contract. When we set the repurchase price sufficiently high, uh, you know that nobody's going to come and repurchase it. So it's uh, essentially equivalent to selling the assets. And the repo market consists of three stages. In the first stage, each lender offers a contract. Uh, and uh, the set of contracts offered is observed by all agents. In the second stage, uh, the lender has an option to withdraw after observing all the contracts that have been offered. So here, um, uh, we uh, IJ here is going to indicate lender J's withdrawal decision. And this is going to be the remaining set of contracts that are offered. Um, in the final stage, the borrowers choose which contract to, um, to go to if they indeed wanted to participate in the market. Um, so for, from the borrower side, uh, they needed to decide whether to participate in the market. They do so if the maximum value they can obtain is positive. And uh, on their payoff function for participating is going to be if they were to choose a contract P, they receive funds PS to be invested in their project. And um, at the end of the economy, uh, they decide whether to repurchase on their assets. So they're only going to repurchase if um, their asset quality is above the agreed repurchase price. So here in the payoff function, um, there is a main function. This is going to be uh, quite essential because it, in contrast to if they were to just engage in an asset sale, uh, the payoff function will be strictly decreasing here. It would, it's, it's weakly decreasing in the asset quality. And in particular, it could be flat and constant uh, uh, across different asset types. So this is the role of the repurchase option in changing the value function for the borrowers. And for the lenders, on. Uh, in the second stage, they decide whether to withdraw the contracts offered. 
And uh, the decision for them is in thinking about if they were not to withdraw, what type of assets would come to them? And, uh, and if their payoff is, their profit is positive, uh, they decide not to withdraw. And of course, in the first stage, they decide uh, the profit maximizing contract to be offered. So there are many possibilities that can emerge given the contract space uh, in equilibrium. To narrow down, we start uh, backward in thinking about the borrower strategy. So in Lama 1, we obtain that um, all borrowers will indeed participate and sign a repo contract. So this is in contrast with um, the standard lemons market where high quality assets stay out. So the intuition uh, we can relate to the motivating example in the beginning where if we were in uh, a situation where uh, some of the assets, the high quality asset decided not to participate, there's a possibility for a lender to uh, profitably deviate by offering a attractive repurchase price to the high quality lenders. And they would find it appealing to participate as well. Uh, and there is going to be um, a threshold type below the threshold, all qualities will default. Um, and um, this is uh, the nature of the repurchase option is also going to allow high quality assets in a way to uh, mimic the low qualities. Um, if suppose a um, high quality asset defaults, while a low quality asset doesn't default. Uh, a high quality asset uh, can always deviate and uh, participate in the contract for the low quality assets because they are paying the same repurchase price but getting something of ha higher value back. So given uh, the borrower's um, participation, we know that actually only two types of contracts are relevant. Uh, the first type is the highest sales price contract, the contract that uh, pays the most for selling the asset because for the assets that end up defaulting, they only care about how much they are selling for. The other contract is the highest non-default value contract uh, because for the non-defaulting assets, um, they know that they are eventually going to buy back their assets. So they wanted to go to the contract that gives them the highest value if they, they don't default. And in fact, we can further show that these two contracts are actually the same contract, that the two type of um, the defaulting and non-defaulting asset must be pulled together. And um, it's going to be that uh, the repurchase price is going to be equivalent to the threshold type. And the sales price is going to be uh, the breaking even price for the lenders. So, so now um, this is why um, polling must occur in equilibrium. Suppose we are, so this is the contract space on the horizontal axis, we have the repurchase of price on the vertical, it's the sales price and the relevant one up below the 45 degree line. So suppose we're in a situation that there's separation of uh, the uh, contract for the defaulting and non-defaulting asset there can be a profitable deviation from the lender side by uh, increasing the sales price without altering the repurchase price. It's going to attract uh, all the um, defaulting assets because they are selling for more. And it's also going to be attracting the non-defaulting price, uh, non-defaulting non assets as well. Um, 
because now uh, they can go to this polling contract with um, a higher sales price and they know they're going to um, buy back for sure. So, um, so in equilibrium, polling must occur. So now, uh, so we can restrict the set of um, equilibrium to this zero profit curve from the lender's perspective. Um, and we can further show that there must be a unique equilibrium where um, there is just one single zero profit pulling contract that uh, attracts all assets to the market. And it's going to be the contract that maximizes the non-default value for, for the assets that doesn't default. Uh, the intuition for this is that because of cream steaming, the competition from the lender side to cream steam high quality non-default asset is going to lead the equilibrium to this outcome. Graphically, um, going back to the earlier graphical illustration that we narrow our attention to all possible contracts on the zero profit curve. So if we were in, uh, so the equilibrium must be that we maximize the value of the high quality non-default asset. If we were to be above this point, uh, there is going to be profitable deviation downward because by um, adjusting towards this direction, we can improve the payoff of the high quality assets. Um, and, and then the remaining contract, the original contract that will only have the low quality asset is going to suffer a loss. And this is where the withdrawal is useful for the equilibrium refinement that this contract will be withdrawn and the equilibrium moves towards here. Uh, the same applies in the other direction as well. When we uh, are below the equilibrium, there can be profitable deviations from the lender side to cream, um, to cream scheme, again, the high quality assets first, and they will move to here. And of course, in this scenario, because it also improves the sales price, so the low quality assets also find it attractive to go to here. So the withdrawal- so you, you know, you're talking about equilibrium and Eve used the word refinement. In this context, it might be nice to have a relatively formal definition of an equilibrium and think, and think uh, about what we might mean by a refinement because I'm not sure about that right now. So it's going to be a sub-game perfect equilibrium given the three stage game we have specified where on the lenders on um, the lenders uh, maximize their problem and the buyers also, um, this, the borrowers also maximize their payoff. And, and I mean, sounds a bit like a signaling game, doesn't it? You might think there's lots of equilibrium without a refinement, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, so given the conditions of the equilibrium, this is the only possible outcome. There can be potentially signaling by going to a particular contract, you are signaling your type, but it doesn't occur in equilibrium because there's, there's only going to be one contract that's offered from a sub game perfect. Huh. Does that make sense? I'm not sure, but please continue. So, okay, so uh, let me continue. So here, uh, this particular point can be conveniently characterized analytically because it's a point where uh, the payoff function for the non-defaulting types is tangent to the zero profit curve. So it must be that when we move away from here, the slope is uh, the inverse of the gross interest um, gross return on the project. 
And uh, if we were to break even here, it must be if I were to increase the sales price by $1, we increase uh, the uh, repurchase price in a way that uh, the default rate is reflecting the slope. And therefore we can characterize that the default rate is on uh, a function of the return on the project. And therefore uh, the repurchase price is just on uh, the uh, inverse density of this default probability that uh, the types below on uh, this price, the, the types with quality below this price is going to default. And according to zero profit, uh, we also obtain the sales price. So in thinking about uh, what would be the optimal repo contract design, we consider instead the mechanism design problem from a planner's perspective that um, they were to choose all possible um, contracts for different quality types and how much, um, to what extent, on um, which types they wanted to attract to the market subject to the incentive compatibility constraint for different qualities and the participation constraint and must be budget neutral. So, so really uh, the way of, of thinking about what would be the optimal contract in a mechanism design problem uh, follows in a very similar way because in the end, uh, according to the borrower's payoff function, there is going to be uh, a threshold type that ends ends up defaulting or not. And we can narrow our attention also to only two contracts. And uh, the difference is going to be, it's going to be a different contract on the zero profit curve because now uh, the, from the planner's perspective, it's desirable to maximize the extent of cross subsidization across different qualities. And it's achieved when the participation constraint for the non defaulting types is binding. And it, it's exactly the same contract under the optimal security design if we can um, uh, allow the, have the lenders to commit to this contract extenting. And it's going to the point, to be the point to the right of the equilibrium contract offering a higher amount of sales price and therefore a higher amount of liquidity. So here the source of inefficiency is going to be exclusively coming from the cream, cream scheming behavior of competitive lenders in the market setting because they are going to be able, they, they wanted to attract the highest quality lenders by maximizing their non-default value, but the optimal contract should be uh, maximizing the extent of cross subsidization. And uh, uh, to think about uh, the conditions where uh, repo contract in comparison to SSLs, under what condition one is superior to the other. Um, so here we think of uh, the, uh, some statistics where here, the, this is if we were to uh, pick a threshold type that's willing to sell at the polling price in standard lemons market. Um, this would be the polling price and lambda is the total amount of liquidity. Um, we characterize a sufficient statistic condition under which repo dominates SSLs. So to understand this condition, it's going to imply that if we were to achieve the same amount of uh, liquidity as in the 
ripple equilibrium, what would be the threshold type? And is this threshold type willing to participate? So this is graphically uh, to achieve the same amount of liquidity as in the ripple equilibrium, what would be the threshold type? And in this particular case, um, this threshold type is not going to be willing to participate in the sales, if, uh, in the asset sales market, and therefore ripple dominates. So we we can use a very simple uniform distribution to sh to show that very often. Uh, under very mild conditions, uh, ripple dominates. So this is a uniform uh, distribution example where the average quality is one and the asset quality dis dis uh, dispersion is sigma. And the investment project pays off 5%. So in terms of aggregate liquidity, um, we should, so as the amount of dispersion increases from zero uh, to higher levels, the SSL equilibrium is going to unravel quite quickly and the liquidity goes down by uh, a large extent. However, the ripple equilibrium and also the optimal security design is going to uh, be much more uh, robust in terms of uh, maintain, sustaining the liquidity level. And it's coming from the participation channel um, of, um, of the, uh, in the SSL. And in particular, um, so this is uh, the, uh, a case where um, if we have, uh, so this is to show that under very mild conditions, ripple dominates. Suppose we are in a 5% asset return. So a um, small amount of dispersion is going to lead to the dominance of ripple over SSLs. And uh, uh, given that I'm running out of time, uh, the last, uh, point I wanted to mention that it's actually quite robust under different equilibrium notions. And this is how we started this project. It's actually, as the title in the program suggests, uh, uh, we, we initially uh, considered an alternative equilibrium refinement under competitive search. So, so in this equilibrium notion, on uh, um, which we borrow from Greer, Shanner, and Wright, the lenders post contract and each of them fulfill one contract. So in a sense, in comparison to the alternative equilibrium setting uh, to the market structure, uh, the lenders are capacity constrained. The market kind of clears by adjusting the trading probability in different separate markets where lenders post contracts and borrowers decide where to search for. And the outcome is a separating equilibrium as they show that um, a separation is sustained by rationing um, the trading probability of high quality assets. So each type of quality gets sold at their true value with a probability, it was a limited probability that um, allows um, the high quality asset to be separated from the low quality asset. So when we introduce repo, however, um, the when we enrich when we introduce the repurchase option, turns out that rationing doesn't occur, and that break breaks down the separation force uh, in this in the competitive search market. And we also obtain a unique pooling equilibrium where uh, all assets get sold at uh, the lowest possible price and uh, repurchase is available at the lowest price. So here it's going to strictly improve the outcome uh, for all types of asset qualities and therefore repo strictly dominates SSLs. So, 
out of time to conclude on, on the idea is that uh, repo emerges um, as a natural outcome in markets with adverse selection in resolving the lemmas problem. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Leon and thanks to the organizers for uh, inv inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, okay, so okay, what uh, what is repo? So I know most people or probably everybody knows, but just uh, so you are a, uh, you are a borrower, so you have uh, some investment opportunity or some uh, commitment, so you need cash. Uh, uh, but you don't have cash and you have some asset for, for any reason, uh, you don't want to sell the asset. So you go to a lender, uh, and uses this, use this repo contract, which means that, uh, you put the, you basically sell the asset with an option to repurchase it at a certain price. So this is basically a repo and, uh, F, like, uh, for the, uh, last, uh, 10 or 20 years, it has been. Uh, it has been extensively used in financial transactions. Uh, okay, so what does this paper do? Uh, so, okay, so uh, this is uh, basically, this paper proposes a theory on why repos are useful based, based on adverse selection problem. And it says basically that repo naturally arises when you have uh, adverse selection problem. And now I a little bit uh, emphasize on this, that this is common value private information, meaning that, uh, so it's uh, very much like a uh, uh, classic uh, Carlo Lemons market. So uh, there is an asset and both of us uh, uh, care about the value of the asset, but the, say the lender in, in the repo does not know the value of the asset, but the, uh, the borrower knows. So it is different, for example, than, uh, than uh, just uh, private value asymmetric information, which means that, for example, the borrower may have some uh, some liquidity needs or may have, uh, or the project, for example, has some return that the lender doesn't know. No, this is not the case here. So the case here is that the project has uh, has a known uh, return, but the asset, uh, like the pro private information is about the asset. Okay, uh, so uh, the paper shows that uh, the repo is generally constrained inefficient uh, and uh, taxes and subsidies uh, on repo cannot correct the inefficiency, uh, which is correct, but I'm going to make one comment regarding this. Basically, I'm going to suggest an, uh, another scheme to, to try to improve efficiency, see what happens. Uh, and uh, then uh, the paper find conditions under which uh, repo, basically it's the if and, if, if and only if conditions, like repo is better than sales. Uh, okay, so, uh, I just give you a uh, short description of the model, not the like the full model, but just two type uh, two type model, uh, to uh, to basically uh, show you what is the what 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 are the results and what does equilibrium look like in this environment. So uh, the authors um, give this two type example in the intro, but they do not follow up with that, uh, and of course because you lose some generality when you look at this two type example, and they do not fully characterize it in the paper, but I think uh, I characterize it, I may be wrong, but, but let's see. Uh, so again, so description of the model, so borrowers have access to a project with the return, return, return rate R, which is known to everybody, uh, but they do not have funds, they do not have cash, uh, each borrower has one asset, say low type or high type with probability half, say, and they cannot commit repayment. And of course, this is the uh, heart of the model. So if borrower can commit repayment, uh, you can, you could do much better in this environment. And actually, because the, there is a kind of constant return to a scale technology. So if they could, re, uh, if they could commit, then uh, the borrower and lender uh, can write a good contract and, uh, and uh, um, make a lot of investment and get a lot of return. 
uh, okay, so borrowers cannot come into repayment, so uh, they can borrow cash, sell the asset with an option to repurchase, use this repo, uh, then lenders post terms of trade simultaneously. Then all lenders see other postings, the posting of other lenders, and they can withdraw if they want. If not, then borrowers choose a contract and then, uh, then uh, they act according to contract. Uh, and of course, if the borrower does not pay back the money, then uh, the lender just sees, uh, sees the asset. Okay, so the results in this, uh, so equilibrium is pooling. Uh, there is full participation. And I think this is um, like one of the main points of the paper. Uh, and there are on the equilibrium path, basically there are default of some borrowers in this example, basically low types. Uh, and uh, repo, so if you, I think, if you want to take perhaps one uh, message from this paper is that repo increases participation compared to sales. So what do I mean by this? So look at this, uh, this table. So it's basically uh, 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 from the paper, just uh, reconstructed it. Uh, so the collateral value, so suppose the low quality is like 40 and uh, high quality is 80. And suppose basically borrower and lender as is in the paper uh, values the asset uh, the same amount, okay? So just look at the borrower. So 40 for low type, uh, so it's low lemon and 80 for high type. Okay, so uh, there are three uh, things here. So sale equilibrium, what is sale equilibrium? So in the sale equilibrium, uh, uh, of course, if we didn't know the lemon problem, so you would say uh, the price would be 60, but of course, high quality people do not want to, uh, don't, don't want to sell the asset with the uh, price 60. So the price goes down and it turns out that in this very simple example, so the price cannot be higher than 40 in the sale equilibrium. Uh, and uh, of course, high type wouldn't, uh, wouldn't participate in the market, right? So average funds length would be 20 because only low types and they are half of the population. So the value added in this economy would be four, high types do not participate. Uh, low types get eight, uh, get eight, and lender, of course, a zero profit condition. So this is sale equilibrium. The I'm optimal. Just re clarifying question. Sure, so absolutely. Sale equilibrium. You mean that's an equilibrium given the restriction we have to use sales? Uh, no, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just, yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm comparing different equilibrium. If you have to oh, use yeah, sales, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, you compare different equilibrium in the sense that you're labeling things sale equilibrium, repo equilibrium, but. One thing you can mean by a sale equilibrium is you allow very, very general contracts. It turns out people are selling the assets and not using repos in equilibrium. And well, say, sorry. Else, which, given they have to use sales, what's the equilibrium? Is that, which is it? It is the second one. If they have to use the sales, what's the equilibrium? Because sale is basically... Uh, is a, a special case of repo in this environment. Uh, so it's a latter that you said. So if they have to use sales, what's the equilibrium? And this is the equilibrium. Okay. Okay. So the optimal repo is uh, basically uh, purchase price would be 50 uh, and the repurchase price is 60. So why? Because here uh, the low type would default uh, because you have to, the low type has to pay 60, but the value of asset is just 40. So it's not worth it for the low type, right? So uh, low type defaults. So the lender gets 40 from the low type, but high type would like to pay back. So the lender uh, gets uh, 60 back from the, from the high type. So on average, uh, the lender uh, breaks even. The high type also gets uh, zero because it's like, uh, I forgot, it's like 20% uh, return because the high type gets 50 and uh, re uh, the return of the contract, uh, the return of the project would be just 20% uh, uh, of 50. So the high type just returns everything. Uh, and low type gets a very good deal here. Uh, he basically gets 60 minus 40 because he just le leaves the asset with the lender and enjoy 60 minus 40. So this is low type. And this is like uh, value added in this environment. So, and uh, the authors now show that the equilibrium repo would be uh, like, according to the, this equilibrium uh, uh, basically would be 40. 
So the price wouldn't be different from the sale equilibrium. Of course, this is a special case because of this two type. If you have a kind of continuum of types, this would be different. But I think for illustration purposes, I think uh, this gives you the main idea of the paper. Uh, but the point is that both types now participate. Uh, so uh, the repurchase price is also 40, but now both types participate because high type can basically take use of uh, his, nah, his or her asset because uh, they put the asset there as collateral basically and pay back because 40 is less than 80. So both types uh, participate. So it's 40 all average funds, uh, like average funds lends in the equilibrium and then the value added would be eight. So basically my point here, uh, there are two points. And I think this is summarizes like uh, um, some points in the paper, which is first uh, repo is better than sales because uh, it increases participation. Second, it's not as good as optimal repo because in the optimal repo, this cream scheming thing is there. So uh, I think part of the contribution of the paper is saying that although we have a pooling equilibrium, but because of cream scheming, uh, you get some inefficiency. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, I just skip this. Okay, so um, I'm going to, okay, so this is a simple model, uh, nicely written, uh, interesting results. Uh, they consider several variations, that's, uh, they're good things. Uh, okay, so I have two comments, basically, uh, two main comments. Uh, one is on empirical motivation, and I think part of the things uh, discussed in the chat box like is related to what I'm going to say. And second one is a mechanism to improve efficiency. Uh, uh, okay, let's go one by one. So especially the first one. Uh, so the paper is providing a theory on usefulness of repos under adverse selection, but in practice, uh, if this theory was kind of uh, very much what goes on in reality, we should see more kind of assets subject to adverse selection uh, to be used in repos compared to kind of safe assets, although the, the, uh, the, it is opposite to this. So let me elaborate on this a little bit. Uh, okay, so I just put two quotes from the paper, not just to pick up on the on the uh, on the certain sentences, but just because they uh, summarizes the points uh, well. So it says the repos are natural outcome markets with adverse selection, and repos are only detrimental when asymmetric information is not a big problem to begin with. Uh, so basically, my argument is exactly that many assets used in the repos are considered are not considered to be subject to this common value private information. Uh, like government bonds in EU is like more than 80% and in US is like two third of the market, like more than 65%. Um, okay, so again, I, uh, I emphasize that it's not about common value private information. I think for treasuries, for example, with it's hard to think that there is any common value private information, but it might be some uh, private value private information, meaning that, for example, I have some treasuries, but I am desperate to sell them, but you don't know that. And uh, this can create some asymmetric information, but the paper does not really model this part. So it's all about the private information about the value of the asset. Uh, so related to this first comment, uh, uh, the authors uh, in a, in a nice uh, kind of extension, uh, they are, or in a nice section in the paper. So they are trying to find some uh, evidence to back this story. Uh, but again, they uh, basically associate higher riskiness of the asset with the existence of more private information. But, uh, but uh, again, you can think that there is one asset is more risky, but the uncertainty is shared between basically borrower and lender both. Like uh, we do not know what would be the return of this asset, but both of us do not know. So the higher riskiness doesn't mean that, uh, that there is like necessarily more adverse selection problem. So if we want to make that argument, we need, we need, some uh, like some argument for that uh, and uh, just uh, okay 
uh, borrower and another point is that in in this I think in the same section they say borrowers are better at forecasting future security prices than lenders based on for example I don't know if you are a dealer you get like you you learn more in the market uh, so you may know more than the other side of the of the uh, of the trade but uh, and I I can. Uh, I, I, I take that, that some players in the market are more informed than others, but why should we think that these are always the borrowers who are better informed, informed ones? If this is really their story, so uh, why should we think that it's one side of the trade? Okay, so the second point that I want to make is about, uh, basically it's just a suggestion uh, of how to improve efficiency in the market. It's based on my JET paper, but also it's related to Shenzhen's paper in the morning actually. Uh, okay, so what is this? Um, as uh, Just uh, think about the two type example that I showed you. Uh, the repo price is lower than the optimal level because of cream skimming. And the paper uh, correctly argues that the taxes and subsidies on repos cannot help. Uh, so let's just think about uh, what make like what is the main friction in this economy. Uh, in my viewpoint, is that the borrowers cannot commit to pay back. Otherwise, it would be optimal to invest large amounts of money. As I said, you can find some contract uh, because there is a constant return to a scale. Uh, so uh, so. Let's now see what goes kind of wrong in the equilibrium. Uh, so amount of funding is uh, basically bound by zero profit condition. So in, in this two type example, zero profit condition says the, uh, the purchase price, PS, is uh, basically, uh, so what you get has to cover that. So you get with half probability, you get high type and the high type uh, return the money. So you get PR. With half probability, you get low type, uh, which does not pay back, who, who does not pay back. So you just get sigma, uh, le, sorry, lambda L. Uh, so this is basically amount of funding. It's PS in the equilibrium. So it's bound by this uh, lambda L. Uh, so what's the idea? So it's just very simple. Uh, Suppose somehow you can increase this sigma, this sorry, this lambda L uh, for lenders in the in this environment, uh, basically, uh, and then uh, of course this is going to uh, lead uh, lenders to to lend more. Uh, the borrowers uh, can get higher return, and especially the the binding one is high types because they get zero. So basically now we are trying to uh, to get more funding to uh, to kind of increase the size of the pie and investment and get more and then kind of tax these guys back. So what is the exact mechanism that I'm thinking is this one. So the mechanism, uh, so I'm just talking about the, these two type again, but I think it's easy to generalize it probably to the uh, setting of the paper, which is a continuum of types. Um, uh, so we are running a bit short of time. Could you wrap up in one or yes, two minutes? Yeah. In one minute, I'm done, uh, hopefully. So uh, so what's the mechanism? So the mechanism it says that any asset brought to the government counter by a lender uh, is going to be paid like $10. And uh, then the planner, uh, the mechanism designer is going to tax all borrowers uh, like say $5 here. Uh, and of course, there's an assumption here that planner can distinguish between borrowers and lenders. Uh, so what's going on in, if you just use this mechanism or so, uh, basically this is going to create a wedge between the value of the asset for borrowers and lenders. Uh, now the repo, uh, the equilibrium, which is a still subject to this criminal scheming problem. So, but, what happens is that the purchase price uh, goes up to 50, repurchase price to 50. Uh, so uh, the pie gets bigger. Uh, and now you are going to sub to tax high type and low types by five, but now, uh, uh, but now uh, you uh, like both high type and low types are, uh, are, are positive. So you're fine. And as a matter of fact, you can even go up to in this example to, uh, T equals to around 27, uh, and uh, you create value up to 13, 
13 dollars or 13 units in this economy so basically this is just kind of a one cross subsidization scheme that may help but again come uh, based on uh, or or uh, subject to this assumption uh, so i'm just uh, i'm not suggesting that this should be only the way but just uh, basically food for thought if you want to follow up uh, on uh, on on a mechanism to improve efficiency in this environment again it is a still subject to uh, cream skimming, but I think it's uh, going to change to make it better compared to the equilibrium uh, without intervention. And uh, just okay, I'm I'm I, I, so okay. The last uh, very quick point is that so uh, I think it would be nice if the borrower's credit risk or some information uh, problem about the project uh, is also kind of. Um, added to this model maybe to the next paper but because when you uh, when i was just uh, did some reading for repos uh, it's especially these practitioners they are mostly uh, worried about the borrower's credit risk not necessarily about the uh, the uh, the value of the uh, asset like uh, but but just probably that's uh, another paper i'm done Okay, Lian, do you want to um, thanks, respond? Yeah, sure. Um, Mohamed, thanks very much for the nice discussion. I think uh, the one period, um, the two type example that you, you used really was able to capture the essence of the paper um, in, in instances that I might not have been able to convey. Uh, and uh, regarding the two comments, I think it's, two very useful suggestions that we uh, wanted also to address and also to think about, to, to think more uh, in the empirical part. And also uh, I, uh, I wanted to emphasize probably it's not a repo theory of everything. It's a repo theory of some classes of assets, but for treasuries, which admittedly is a very segment of the market, Perhaps there are better explanations such as uh, institutional constraints that some borrowers are unable to sell it as Duffy highlighted uh, in the 90s already. And, uh, and the second comment with the uh, mechanism for, for uh, from your jet paper, I think uh, we should look into it. Perhaps there is something that we can borrow and it's going to kind of improve some aspects of the paper. Um, so perhaps we have time for one more question. Um, All right, so maybe I can go back to, so Leanne, can you put this slide where, with, the, with the equilibrium, with a graphical device for the equilibrium? I just sure. wanna, I think uh, we, we were a bit hand wavy to the questions that uh, Ben and Randy asked. So I just wanna explain how this timing uh, you know, helps us deal with the issue of, uh, of equilibrium beliefs. So, so the, the issue with of, of equilibrium beliefs is that if you're in a stat, if, if you're in a situation where, uh, you know, lenders post contracts and there's no action after that, then you could, you could, you're in the, you end up with, with, with an issue of what happens with off equilibrium beliefs. So for example, if, if we are in an equilibrium where everyone puts P star, then you know that can be an equilibrium, but you have to think what would happen if if somebody offers a deviation. So th that's where you have to think of, of of equilibrium beliefs. In our setup, so what happens is that uh, it, basically there's an interim stage, so agents can withdraw the contract. Now, given the set of contracts that are, you know are in uh, offered in in an interim stage. You know exactly who, who, which borrower is going to go to what contract. You can solve that because there's at most two contracts. That's the result we showed. So with that, you can work backwards, and you know which contracts among the ones that are offered are profitable. So, you know, in, in that stage, still you need you need to know which ones are withdrawn or which ones are are not. But once you go one step backwards uh, to the first stage, when you when you actually post the contract, then you know then that refines the equilibrium in the sense that only the contracts that are profitable 
survive. So that's the way it works. So it's a fact that you have that interim stage where you, you have an action by the, by the lender that allows you to, to pin down one equilibrium. It's not selecting, it's pinning down the, the, the equilibrium and, and, and that's it. Thank you so much, Saki. Thank you so much, Leanne. Uh, sorry about the interruption, but uh, we need to keep the program going. So um, we're gonna have David uh, presenting the keynote next and maybe Randy will want to introduce them again. Sure, I could do that. Um, it's actually, I just thought it was kind of funny that at this conference I get to introduce two people, David and Ricardo, which is funny because David Ricardo was one of the great classical economists. <laughs> I guess you guys should write a paper together. It's like a bit like real, real like Hoppe Hein would be the Victor Hugo model, but that's another story. So, so I thought, I remember meeting David Andofano when he was a graduate student in Western Ontario. Even back then, he was an amazing person in many dimensions. I remember discussing his paper at the meetings in Canada one year, which was, I think, at 8.30 in the morning. And I managed to show up because I left the bar around four, but he was still going strong. My main comment on his presentation is that I would understand maybe not wearing a tie, but you could have put his shirt on. He was just wearing his underwear, at least from the way it stopped. But it was a great paper. I suppose that was your AER paper that you presented there, which is a brilliant paper, way ahead of its time. It, it put uh, search into general equilibrium in a way that had not been done. So by general equilibrium, I don't mean, you know, Peter Diamond style or even more in some Pizzeretti style, but, you know, a GE model with markets and, and, and consumption and, and risk averse people you know, a regular macro kind of model. It was way ahead of its time. He has other fundamental work on labor, money, maybe especially on banking. His work on banking, it's like a microcosm of the whole field of banking. So, you know, you read a paper on the diamond Dibvig model. This is like 35 years after the original publication. New paper, bank runs cannot exist in this model. Then six months later, there's another paper. You can get bank runs if you think of it this way. Then another paper, six months later, bank runs are impossible. And Alfaro even does this sometimes in two uh, concurrent, is that the word? Seminars at the same rate as <laughs> one year. Somebody, one of the authors presents the work with Nozal and maybe Wallace or maybe, I forget, proving that bank runs are impossible in the diamond dipping environment. The next presentation is Andalfado with a model of bank runs. I always found that kind of interesting. He also, it's not maybe well understood that ignoring Hirschleifer, who was talking about something kind of simple, first person to think about this opacity idea and informational insensitivity, which I always found a bit, uh, it's a strange notion, but it's certainly correct that sometimes you want to keep the information hushed up. And the reasons are clear from his, his presentations and papers on this. So I always learn a lot from Dave. He's also a thorn in my side because you, you always say, okay, what would a central banker want to do based on your theory? And I don't always know the answer, but it's a great question. So without further ado, let me present David Andalfato. Thanks very much, uh, Randy. Uh, am I coming through okay, guys? I presume so, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks to uh, Randy and Jonathan for uh, putting me on the program and organizing this this great conference. It's really uh, so uh, so nice to see you all again, and I hope we can do it again in person uh, pretty soon. Um, I thought that uh, for today, uh, what I would talk about is um, uh, well, basically an idea that was um, you know first published. Uh, I first saw it uh, by Sargent and Wallace, uh, some unpleasant monetarist arithmetic. Actually, this is the 40th uh, year anniversary of that paper. And uh, so I thought because of the, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about uh, um, fiscal situation in the United States and elsewhere, and even, you know, since COVID, but even before the growing accumulation of national debt, the, the rising debt to GDP ratio, uh, what the implications of this might be going forward in terms of uh, inflationary consequences, 
uh, what what central banks might be to to, to tackle that problem should it, uh, uh, should that problem rear its head. I thought it was a this would be a good time, especially in light of the 40th anniversary, to to kind of bring this uh, this notion this uh, that Sergeant and Wallace introduced us to uh, to bring it to our talk today. Uh, so we can talk about it. Why is this not? Uh oh, uh, there you go. So I don't know how many people actually <laughs> read that paper anymore, but uh, I'll just uh, summarize what I uh, what I think are the key takeaways, uh, the uh, key ideas and takeaways. First, the first thing uh, you know what impressed me when I, I read it was that monetary and fiscal policy are, are essentially they're necessarily uh, linked together uh, through a consolidated government budget constraint. Um, and so these decisions, uh, you know, to the extent that uh, a country has, say, a, a separate uh, central bank, um, and not, not all countries do, by the way, so, but to the extent that you have different authorities that are in charge of different aspects of whatever they're responsible for, their decisions are, are, are necessarily going to have to be coordinated in some manner. And, um, and so this, uh, you know, a question naturally arises as to, you know, if there's any sort of conflict between these authorities, which, which one might be expected to prevail, or which authority uh, is dominant. Um, the, the monetarist proposition is that basically is implicit, at least, that the monetary authority is, is dominant. But um, Sergeant and Wallace, you know, uh, to me, they convinced me of the idea of, you know, well, maybe that's not always such a, a good idea to, to make that assumption. And so they, they write down this model. It's a little, a nice little overlapping generations model. And they, they show that even, even if one was to adopt uh, the monetarist uh, um, proposition that the, the price level is you know, roughly proportional to the, so the money supply is defined, say, by uh, the base money supply, uh, that the long run rate of inflation may nevertheless uh, be under fiscal control, not under monetary control monetary policy control. So um, under, uh, indeed under a dominant fiscal authority, what they show is that any, any attempt um, by the central bank to, to say bring the rate of inflation down, that is to say tighten monetary policy could backfire. Uh, and, and, and tightening monetary policy today could own, potentially lead to an even higher rate of inflation in the future. And, and indeed, they, they consider an extension of their model where they demonstrate it could be even worse than that, that a tightening monetary policy today might even lead to higher inflation today. So very, very kind of counterintuitive, uh, provocative results. Um, and they conclude that, uh, that contrary to uh, what Milton Friedman laid out in his famous 1968 presidential address, where Friedman claimed that, well, monetary policy was basically uh, neutral uh, in the long run for all real variables that at least, at least uh, uh, the central bank could be relied on to, uh, to, to control inflation. And, and the Sargent and Wallace uh, paper suggested that even this is something that per is perhaps outside of the control of the central bank. So, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, the conventional wisdom is actually uh, kind of either, you know, people kind of recognize this possibility and, and just kind of dismiss it or, or suggest that, well, we know that, but, you know, in, in, in most developed economies, we've, we've adopted institutions where the central bank is, is dominant um, or, or uh, the possibility is just ignored. I mean, it's just never talked about. Um, and indeed, this conventional wisdom, you can see it, it's embedded in, in uh, the FOMC, the, the Federal Reserve actually believes this. Um, so if you go and read the FOMC statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy, this is basically the, the Federal Reserve's uh, Nicene Creed. It's, it's kind of where we lay out uh, what we truly believe. Uh, and among the, the statements in, in there is the following one that I quote, uh, what we believe is that the inflation rate over the longer run is primarily determined by monetary policy. And hence the committee, that is to say the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, has the ability to specify a longer run goal for inflation. And this is in contrast to other parts of the statement that say, you know, uh, while we do have a dual mandate, we don't similarly uh, adopt uh, uh, any specific metric, say for the unemployment rate, because we understand that in the long run, monetary policy has no control over many variables, but consistent with Friedman, 
1968, at least we know we can control the rate of inflation. Um, so I, I kind of think, you know, this is that may be true, but it's a, it's a, this, a, it's this bit of a religious statement, right? I mean, it, it really requires uh, uh, that you believe in something that may not actually uh, be true. <clears throat> and Sergeant and Wallace kind of convinced me, at least, that it, it's, it's maybe something to, to take seriously. Um, and so uh, what I want to, um, my talk is basically motivated by the idea that the Fed and other central banks should be possibly prepared for some unpleasant monetarist arithmetic going forward. And, and by this, I don't mean to say that these events are going to transpire. I, I, I transpire. I, I just mean that the Fed should be formulating a contingency plan uh, in the event that something like this uh, was to happen. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, delivering a keynote, you know, you usually, it's, 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 they give this to the old farts in the crowd to kind of opine, <laughs> kind of say provocative things. And this is what I want to do with this slide. It's kind of something that um, I hope will provoke. It's, it's meant to provoke really. Um, what I want to explain today is why the true power for long run inflation control does in fact rest with the fiscal authority, uh, even in the United States today. Uh, I want to explain why Volcker, I mean, common, uh, uh, in contrast to, to uh, common folklore, uh, I want to explain why Volcker did not unilaterally reduce the long run rate of inflation in the 1980s. And moreover, well, I'm gonna explain why his attempt to do so probably made things worse than they, they needed to be. Uh, I'm gonna explain why, um, since the financial crisis, why Yellen and Powell uh, were unable to raise inflation over the past decade. There's been a, a kind of this uh, low-flation puzzle, a term coined by the uh, International Monetary Fund. Um, ironically, <laughs> when the Fed actually formally uh, adopted a 2% inflation target in, in 2012, uh, we immediately began to miss that target from below uh, for the next uh, 10 years and continue to do so today. And so this is a bit of a puzzle as to why, if the Fed does have control over the long run rate of inflation, why, why has the Fed been missing uh, for a decade uh, this target from below? Um, I'm going to provide an explanation for this. Uh, fourth, I want to explain why the growing uh, U.S. government debt and deficits are byproducts of inflation targeting and U.S. Treasury demand and, and not uh, uh, out of control government spending. And then finally, I want to uh, explain why I think we need to be prepared uh, for some unpleasant monetarist arithmetic. Okay, so in my talk today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow uh, Sargent and Wallace's lead. I'm going to write down, uh, as they did, uh, a simple overlapping generations model. Um, I, I don't think there's anything special about the OG model here. Uh, um, Fernando Martin and I have a version of their Lagos and Wright model that I think would have suited this purpose as well. Uh, I'll just, in the tradition of uh, Sargent and Wallace, I'll stick to a simple OG model. And uh, unlike them, I'm going to uh, focus on steady states. And they, they were looking at uh, transition dynamics, the dynamics. I'm going to focus on, on the long run, uh, which I associate with a steady state. Except for a, a brief subsection of the talk, I'm going to uh, look at some non-stationary dynamics. Because in the model, I'm going to write down uh, the uncoordinated policies are going to generate uh, unsustainable dynamics. And I'm going to associate these, these uh, scenarios with short run dynamics. And, and these short run dynamics I'm going to use to in, provide an interpretation of the Volcker disinflation and, and to provide an interpretation of the Yellen Powell uh, low flation era, era. There's a bit of an asymmetry here uh, that it's kind of interesting to point out is that you know, it's widely ascribed that the Volcker was successful in lowering inflation, but that Yellen and Powell were. Uh, unsuccessful at raising it. And, and the, what the model suggests is there's a bit of an asymmetry in, in that power. And, and so I would like to touch on that. And then, and then I'll resort, I'll go back to steady states and, and just simple comparative statics, just to show how uh, growing debt and deficits uh, can be a byproduct of inflation targeting and a growing demand for safe assets. And, and then I'm going to use the model to demonstrate kind of a hypothetical, you know, what, what would happen, for example, if, if something was to trigger a, a collapse in the demand for U.S. Treasuries for whatever, for whatever reason. 
um, that, that event is, is likely to result in, in this un unpleasant monetary uh, arithmetic uh, result. Okay, so let me describe the model. It's about as simple as you can, you can uh, think. It's gonna be a two period overlapping generations model. Um, people are gonna have a linear preferences over consumption when they're old. So that's about as simple as you can get in terms of preferences. So there's a constant population. The young have an endowment, why? Uh, it, it won't be growing, it's just constant. So there's no, not gonna be any real growth in this model. Um, but given preferences, uh, this, this Y parameter, which represents the income that's generated by the young, it's gonna determine their real savings. So that's just gonna be a parameter. So their desired saving is basically exogenous here. And this is gonna permit me to focus on portfolio decisions rather than the savings decision. Uh, the young have a storage technology. It's very simple. They can take some of their endowment and store it. It's gonna return, uh, if they store it at AT, it returns F of K in the subsequent period where F is an increasing and strictly concave function. And I'm gonna introduce uh, two government securities that I'm going to label money and bonds, but in fact, physically, they're kind of the same thing. You can just think of them as ledger entries in a, in a, in a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, today, both of these things exist primarily in spreadsheets at the New York Fed. They're just balance sheets. The Treasury has a, a, holds its treasuries on a ledger, and, and you can think of M as being reserves, uh, uh, reserves, I guess, yeah, Inter possibly interest-bearing. And so in the model, uh, the young are gonna have a, a simple portfolio choice. They, they have a, a specific amount of saving, a desired saving Y, that's just a parameter, and they have to allocate these, this saving between three variables. The lower case here represent a real uh, uh, deflated terms. So these are like the nominal divided by the price level. So M is how much money, how many bonds, and how much uh, capital to invest in. Uh, any given portfolio choice is going to uh, generate a, a future payoff given by that object at the bottom. Um, the capital is going to generate uh, F of K. Uh, the bond is going to earn an inflation adjusted uh, real rate of return here, right? So RB is the gross nominal interest rate on the bond. Pi T is just the uh, gross inflation rate. So you have an inflation adjusted return on bond and an inflation adjusted return on money. Um, so I'm going to permit the possibility that these, this money earns interest as well. And this is net of a, of a lump sum tax uh, payment tau, which is applied only to the old. If there's any, if anybody has any clarifying questions, you know, feel free to interject. I have a clarifying question, Dave. Yes. These two assets, money and bonds, they're in nominal terms. Yes. That, that seems to be important. They issue a real bond, for example. Um, well, it's kind of hard to talk about inflation, I guess. With, uh, I didn't mean I didn't mean exclusively real bonds, but real bonds in addition to say. Fiat oh, money. Um, I don't know. You can kind of think of this K as being a real bond, I guess, if you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, so may, maybe the question you have is, um, if I was to introduce, say, a TIPS security into the model, how might this uh, change any of my conclusions? And so, inflation adjusted or something, right? Yeah, yeah treasury inflation protected security. Yeah. Tip, yeah. So uh, actually, I haven't thought of that question. So, but, uh, and I'm probably not quick enough right now to, to think about what, how that might affect things. I suspect not, but I mean, I, I don't know, but it's, it's something I'll think about because, uh, you know, the, the Treasury does issue inflation protected securities. Mind you, they're not the, they're not the most significant part of the uh, Treasury issuance, but what if it was? I mean, that's a good question. And my guess is you could just fold it into your, your G. You're going to have a path for deficits. You probably just fold that in there and things will go through. I agree. I haven't talked about deficits here. Where where you're going to have them very soon, I imagine, in the budget constraint of the government. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll see. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, I just want to pause, though. Uh, I want to say, you know, there's a, a way to think about the young in this model. It's kind of representing uh, some sort of financial sector, like a bank, so that the um, 
and, and the reason why I want to do this, I'll motivate in a moment. But you know, you can think of the the young as as taking uh, these deposits. Um, uh, why? and issuing these li deposit liabilities that promise an after-tax rate of return of CT plus one over Y. And they use these liabilities to fund a given portfolio consisting of uh, reserves, treasury securities, and, and loans. So we could in also interpret K as, as being private loans. I mean, we, you can make this, you can micro-found this mu much better by introducing the you know, needed heterogeneity in the model, but it's just basically gonna be the same thing. Now, the reason why I want to potentially interpret this as, as banks is because if you think about banking, um, you know, there's a lot of regulations that govern uh, banking. And, and so banks face uh, uh, balance sheet restrictions, both on the asset side and the liability side that are, are important. Uh, I'm going to abstract from the liability side restrictions. There's no capital, there's no equity in my model. But on the asset side, I'm going to introduce what kind of are basically a, a, is a reserve requirement that um, um, you can model something like this. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Do you see the little hand there? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, you know, you could imagine the previous optimization problem being done conditional on, a, a, on a con an additional constraint, given this portfolio constraint, this balance sheet constraint that says that this, this bank or this young person has to hold sufficient quantity of government securities to finance, uh, uh, you know, some, some fraction of, uh, they have to hold this against some fraction of their loan, pro private loan portfolio. And, and you can think of sigma and lambda as being parameters. Um, this has very much the flavor of a liquidity coverage ratio in the United States. So liquidity coverage ratio requires banks to hold uh, sufficient quantity of high, what they call high quality liquid assets uh, as, as a fraction of the, of the size of the balance sheet. High quality liquid assets include reserves and in US treasuries and a few other securities. Um, now the liquidity coverage ratio actually treats reserves and treasuries as equal uh, in that formula. But in fact, as I, I discovered just um, last year, um, treasuries are not considered equal <laughs> by banks. Uh, they're not considered as liquid as, as reserves. Uh, and, and this is primarily because of, uh, well, I mean, it has to do with uh, uh, the way regulations, uh, certain Dodd-Frank regulations interact with the fact that there's no standing facility for, for treasury securities. David, uh, fair and, question, so, do, they distinguish, do they distinguish by maturity? No, uh, I don't think so. Um, so the way, the way this works is like the, the so-called GSIBs, the globally systemically important banks are required by under certain Dodd-Frank regulations to hold sufficient quality of, of liquidity for resolution purposes. So living will arrangements. And, uh, and, the, and the regulators are, are telling these banks that they have to hold uh, reserves. They're not permitted to hold treasuries because in, in some events, treasuries aren't gonna be as liquid <laughs> as reserves. And so, so you can think about uh, discounting the value of treasuries, uh, the role as, 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 uh, as reserve assets. So in the model, what I'm gonna do is just uh, ignore this. I'm gonna set that parameter equal to zero. And so I'm just gonna model a, a, what is, looks like just a plain uh, reserve requirement. And this is actually a specification that I'm borrowing from Bruce Smith uh, in, in, in a lot of his work that, that he did. So nice to mention Bruce here too, I think. Okay. Um, so let me describe uh, the policy. So the fiscal authority in the model is gonna be assigned some responsibilities. Uh, it's gonna manage the path of US treasuries. And, and these, Randy, like uh, you said, that these are gonna be, the, D is gonna be nominal. So these are nominal securities. Um, and also the fiscal authority is going to, I'm going to assume, uh, determines the uh, primary surplus. Uh, there's going to be no government spending per se, so uh, the taxes it raises is basically the government surplus. If the taxes are negative, of, of course, it's going to be a primary deficit. And the, uh, the, I'm going to assume that the treasury issuance is just going to grow uh, at the rate mu. Uh, in most of what I, I do, I'm going to assume mu is just constant. Uh, and, you know, as usual, we, uh, we endow the initial O with uh, the initial uh, treasury securities. 
The monetary uh, authority is going to be given a, a different set of powers. The monetary authority is going to be assigned the task of de basically determining the uh, nominal interest rate on these securities. Uh, it's going to determine the, the interest on reserves, um, which, which since 2008, the Fed has been permitted to actually choose the interest on reserves. Prior to that, it was restricted to, to, to uh, uh, charge uh, zero. Um, and the Fed is going to either directly or indirectly influence treasury yields. So you can imagine directly just picking the treasury yield or kind of the way you, uh, we, most of us here are, think about monetary policy. We think about um, uh, what fraction of the outstanding stock of securities is the Fed going to monetize. So the, the money to, I'm going to call this the money to debt ratio, the theta, but either way, uh, this is kind of isomorphic. You, in the model, you can think of the Fed as either ch choosing theta or choosing RB. It's going to be the same thing. There's going to be a one-to-one -one mapping between the two. I think mo most of what I follow up, just going to assume that the Fed picks the nominal interest rate and that the theta is going to adjust by market conditions. Um, and so then we have a consolidated government budget constraint that says the primary surplus is going to be used to finance the interest expense of the outstanding uh, nominal debt. And the interest expense is going to depend in part on what, on what Fed policy is, on what interest rates uh, are going to prevail on, on the different types of securities that are being held, and also on what, what, how, how the outstanding stock of U.S. Treasury debt is divided between uh, reserves and, and bonds. Um, and so I'm going to assume that the monetary authority uh, for the moment, let's just focus on stationary uh, states. So the monetary authority is going to pick an interest on reserves, um, could be zero. Uh, but whatever, I'm going to assume for the moment, at least actually for the talk, that the interest on reserves is less than the interest on, on T-bills. And that the interest on T-bills is also fixed. And so what's true is if the interest rates are fixed in this model, so too is the money to the debt ratio, it's going to be uh, uh, constant in a uh, steady state equilibrium. I'm going to assume that the fiscal authority chooses the rate of, of nominal debt issuance. It's going to, it's going to choose how, how, how quickly it's going to issue treasuries, and it's going to uh, let the uh, primary surplus adjust to satisfy the government budget constraint. Um, you could re imagine reversing this. You could imagine the, the treasury or the fiscal authority choosing the primary surplus and, and letting instead the, the pace of treasury issuance to adjust either way is fine. This is clearly a statement about fiscal uh, dominance here. Okay, so uh, let me describe decision-making. Um, so uh, because, the, it, because reserves are dominated in rate of return, uh, the reserve requirement is going to bind. And so if we take a look at the conditions that characterize uh, optimal uh, portfolio choice, the investment demands, uh, you know, you get the usual first order condition describing the investment demand schedule. So this is basically the marginal product of capital it has to equal the, um, you know, it's uh, some measure of the real rate of interest on, on government uh, securities. Uh, there's some sort of a combination of the interest on T-bills and, and, and the interest on reserves. Remember, the interest on reserves here is going to be important because uh, the, the reserve requirement is binding and is constraining this bank from expanding its loan portfolio. So this is basically, uh, you know, you could also interpret as a you know, arbitrage condition or a fishery equation. Kind of interesting to take a look at this uh, expression because what it says is that the investment demand schedule is, is, is decreasing in the, in the interest rate, kind of depends on which interest rate we're talking about. It's decreasing in the, in the treasury bill rate. Uh, you know, if, if treasury bills become more attractive, you, you, you get a portfolio substitution out of, out, of, out of capital into treasuries. But on the other hand, uh, um, investment demand is actually expanding in, in the interest on reserves rate. And this is because increasing the interest on reserves relaxes the, uh, the reserve, requir uh, reserve requirement constraint. Um, and indeed, uh, when, when Congress granted the Fed the power to, to, to pay interest on reserves in 2008, that was exactly the argument the Fed was, was using back then, was that it would be more efficient, it would be less of a tax for banks if the Fed was permitted to, to pay interest on reserves. Um, 
the rationale for interest on reserves has evolved since then, but that was the original motivation. Okay, so that's very simple, right? Uh, so let's define, I'm gonna define little d here as just the, the sum of outside securities in real terms. So that's gonna be real money balances, real bond balances. Since we have this first period uh, re budget constraint for the young, I could alternatively just write uh, the demand for real outside assets in the following way. Writing it this way just makes it clear that the demand for outside assets here is just gonna be do the opposite of what the demand for investment is gonna do. So the demand for outside assets in this model is gonna be increasing in the treasury bill rate and decreasing in the interest on reserve rate. And then what we can do is just, um, you know, define the market clearing conditions and, and define a steady state equilibrium. One way to do this is to just uh, specify a market clearing condition that, you know, the, the supply of money has to equal the demand for money. Uh, and this little m is the demand for real balances. It depends on the uh, real interest rate. Um, PT is the price level. Uh, and if we invoke this market clearing condition for all time, uh, this implies that the inflation rate is just gonna be the rate of growth of the, of the narrow money supply, base money. So this is a very monetarist kind of proposition. You get people like Milton Friedman nod, nodding their head, yes, that looks right. Uh, so it kind of looks like the central bank is in control of the long run inflation rate. But in fact, that's not true here because uh, remember, I, I assume that the money supply uh, is proportional to the uh, uh, outstanding stock of, of, of nominal debt. So, uh, the money supply is going to grow uh, in a steady state because theta is just constant in a steady state. The money supply here is growing at the pace of treasury issuance. And of course, so that, that implies that the uh, long run equilibrium inflation rate in this model with zero growth is just gonna be mu, but mu is a, is a fiscal variable. So, so here, here's a very simple uh, a way of portraying uh, the Sargent and Wallace idea that, you know, that the long run inflation rate is in fact, uh, is a, a fiscal policy choice. It's, it's not in the control of the central bank. Um, then you can go and, and go to the consolidated government budget constraint, kind of rearrange it around a little bit and, and derive this expression, which is, is very nice. Perhaps if you've, maybe some of you have taught from, um, the uh, uh, nice Champ and Freeman textbook down that the new editions are out with Joe Haslick as a co-author. Uh, I mean, and if you have, you'll recognize this expression as basically the Laffer curve. Um, in, in the Champ and Freeman textbook, uh, they consider, they set RM and RB equal to one. So you have one in the numerator here, which is just a statement that you're assuming that the, the supply of outside assets takes the form of zero interest currency. So minus T is the, uh, the real primary deficit is going to be a function of, of the part in the, the expression in the square brackets is the inflation tax rate. And D here in, in the textbook is the demand for real money balances. Uh, here, um, it's, it's actually the demand for outside assets. So actually this is kind of like a, a bond seniorage uh, equation that's going to depend on stuff, right? It's going to depend on, uh, on these parameters. Um, so it's going to generate the classic uh, uh, Laffer curve too. Um, by the way, just as a matter of empirical evidence on the money to bond ratio, it does look more or less st stationary. If you take a look at the United States, I haven't looked at it for other countries. It does fluctuate around, of course, but by and large over long periods of time, you know, it's, it's average about 15%. So to a first approximation, this idea that the Fed is monetizing some sort of constant fraction of the outstanding treasury issuance, it's not, it's not, a, it's not an outrageous uh, condition to, uh, to impose. And so you arrive right away at the first conclusion. I'm, actually, this conclusion is just saying what I just said, that you get a very, very simple exposition of this uh, Sargent and Wallace proposition that uh, under the conditions that I just described, the long run rate of inflation is in fact a, a fiscally determined variable. It's, it's not under the control of the money uh, of the monetary authority. Um, very quickly, I wanna use this model to uh, explain uh, or interpret, provide an interpretation of the Volcker disinflation era. 
I don't know, most of the people in the audience here probably weren't even alive during then, but I just want to note that um, actually 40 years ago, today I was actually uh, working in the construction sector in Vancouver. And uh, I remember very well uh, interest rates going to 20% and uh, real estate prices collapsing. And I lost uh, my, my union job and also the piece rate jobs I was doing. I mean, uh, I just couldn't get any work. I, I lost my job. Uh, in, in that fall of 1981, uh, and, and I, I had to go back to school <laughs> to, to figure out what happened. Uh, so turns out I became a central banker, thanks to Paul Volcker. Um, this was a, a very traumatic experience, uh, and, and, and Volcker was widely credited, Volcker and the Volcker Fed are widely credited with uh, slaying the inflation dragon that had reared its head during the 1970s. Um, and so I want to see how this kind of might work in, in the model I just wrote. So the way I'm going to uh, work it here is, you know, suppose, suppose we're in a situation where inflation is running high, higher than what the central bank would like. So let, let mu of h denote, uh, you know, the pace of treasury issuance that, that is determining the, the long run inflation rate in the economy. But, you know, Volcker comes along and he wants to lower it to m, mu l. Um, now, in, in the model, in, in the, equal, the equilibrium inflation rate is going to be given by a very monetarist kind of proposition, right? It's going to be the rate of growth of broad money uh, uh, divided by the rate of growth of the demand for, for this, this outside asset. So this is a very kind of monetarist um, uh, proposition where money is just more broadly defined. It's not just base money. It's kind of the entire stock of outside assets. So the question, the thing is, is the Fed could in fact target the inflation rate. It doesn't have any control over the pace of treasury issuance, but it does have control over how the demand for real money balances might, might, might move over time. And so for the Fed to target a lower inflation rate, it's going to have to cause the demand for real money balances to grow over time. And, and so you can just, you know, look at this algebra here. I mean, the, the Fed is going to have to set the dt over dt plus one equal to the ratio of mu, mu L to mu H. And this, this implies that the demand for outside assets has got to grow uh, for as long as mu H is, is bigger than mu L. Um, in this experiment, why don't we just, for the sake of argument, fix the uh, interest on reserves? and kind of think about what would happen if, if I actually populated this model with Volcker and he wanted to try to uh, do this policy. What you can work out is, is what happens here is Paul Volcker, not only does Paul Volcker have to raise interest rates once, because raising interest rates is gonna cause a, a decline in the price level in this model. Um, raising interest rates increases the demand for real money balances and, and, and the way that works is for the price level to drop. Um, in order to, uh, to get the price level to continue to, to drop or to kind of inflate at the lower inflation rate, Paul Volcker has to continue to raise the interest rate in each and every period. He's got to raise it, <laughs> you know, in every quarter, it's got to keep on going up. Um, and at the same time, the money to, to debt ratio is, is declining. Um, what, what's going to happen in this model is because the inflation rate is being pipped, is being pinned down by the Fed, and because the Fed is raising the, the tre nominal treasury rate, what's happening in, the, in this model is the real rate of interest is rising. And this, of course, is causing uh, the demand for investment to collapse. So, so Volcker in this model is inflicting two forms of pain on the fiscal authority. He's, first of all, the, the economy is collapsing. Uh, the investment demand is collapsing. Uh, David Endelfaro is losing his job. And at the same time, um, he's increasing the interest expense of the debt. He's, he's causing pain for, for the administration, for Congress along two dimensions. So he's, he's inflicting a lot of pain on, on everybody, including himself, by the way, is because if you go back and read uh, the, the accounts of the period, you know, he was receiving death threats and stuff like that. So, um, but the point is, is in this model, actually, if, if the fiscal authority sticks by its guns, there's no way Volcker can win. There's no way. Because, because the, the demand for uh, uh, real balances is bounded from above. So there's only so far you can uh, raise interest rates in this model. Uh, a sufficiently resolute fiscal authority is going to beat Volcker. Of course, a tremendous cost 
to the economy and to everybody involved. Uh, at the end of the day, I think what happened is the fiscal authority capitulated. And that's why Volcker won. He won because uh, he forced them to capitulate. And I can explain how that happened uh, in more detail later if you want. But, but the point here is that there's no way he could have won if the fiscal authority was uh, sufficiently uh, resolute. Um, well, let's do the opposite experiment. This is how I interpret the Yellen Powell lowflation episode. Um, suppose, in fact, that we are in a scenario where inflation uh, is running a bit low uh, and the monetary authority kind of wants it higher, kind of a situation like what we're in right now and ever since the financial crisis, in fact. Um, well, here what the Fed would do is the exact reverse now. What the Fed would do is, is lower the policy rate for, uh, and, and of course it can't just lower it once, it has to continue to lower it in each and every period to give sufficient support for the uh, uh, inflation to remain at a, at a higher, higher rate. Um, at the same time, um, you know, corresponding to this is, is the Fed is monetizing larger and larger fractions of the outstanding uh, treasury issuance. And so, um, but the, the point is, is that there's a limit to this uh, as well, because um, there's only so far down the interest rate can go. At some point, it's going to hit the interest on reserves. Um, now, it's true that uh, you can lower the interest on reserves as well, but there's going to be a, an effective lower bound on that as well, possibly politically determined. Uh, and so there's, there's limits, there's a downward limit uh, uh, how far you can go. Once you hit that, once the interest on treasuries is equal to the interest on reserves, you're basically in the so-called uh, liquidity trap scenario. And, um, and that this is a fiscally dominant regime, right? Because in this case, the, the inflation rate is not determined by the, comp the, the price level is not determined by the composition of, outs out, uh, of outside assets. It's determined uh, just completely by the total supply of outside assets. And that's determined by the fiscal authority. Um, and in any case, <laughs> while the Fed is attempting this, what, what it's doing is actually generating an investment boom, and it's also uh, causing the interest expense on the outstanding uh, uh, treasury debt to go down. So these are hardly uh, conditions that are, going to, uh, that are going to inflict pain on the, on the fiscal authority. In fact, this, this, this uh, uh, is going to inflict pleasure. <laughs> so it would be very, very strange to expect fiscal capitulation in this sense. And this is the sense in which uh, the power to achieve the inflation target is kind of asymmetric for a central bank. It's kind of going to be a bit easier to, to make inflation come down uh, than it is to make it go up, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Um, so we have a conclusion here, which is basically what I said. Um, so using interest rate policy or open market operations to pin down the long run rate of inflation is not likely to succeed unless it somehow compels the uh, monetary uh, the fiscal authority to accommodate. Um, nevertheless, the Fed may succeed even under physical, uh, fiscal, fiscal dominance. Um, so for example, uh, suppose the fiscal authority chooses, you know, it fixes the primary uh, deficit, tau, and then you ask the question, in this fiscally dominant regime, suppose what happens if the Fed wants to raise the interest rate? Um, well, if you take a look at this arithmetic in theory, you see that if the, if, if the left-hand side is fixed, the right-hand side is going to have to be fixed. So if the Fed raises the interest rate, uh, the, the, the inflation rate has to rise one for one with the rate of uh, the interest rate. So this is uh, the real rate of interest has to remain fixed. So here you get um, what I, I think is a very neo fisherian type of proposition, that if the Fed wants a higher inflation rate, that the way to do it, uh, Steve Williamson, if you're in the crowd, Steve Williamson is very fond of, of proposing this solution. Steve says, if you want a higher rate of inflation, Fed, what you should do is increase the nominal rate of interest and, and the inflation rate will follow. Now, this is neo fisherian result in my model has nothing to do with the Fisher equation. It has everything to do with unpleasant monetarist arithmetic. So this is kind of where I think the neo fisherians uh, are wrong. I, mean, <laughs> I don't think it has anything to do with the Fisher equation. Um, so that was meant to be provocative. Uh, maybe if Steve's in the crowd, he can push back. 
Let me talk about uh, the debt to GDP ratio. Um, you know, as if you've been looking out the window there in the financial pages, you'll note that the debt to GDP ratio in the United States is, is pretty high as it is in many, in many countries now, thanks, especially since the financial crisis, but even more so now, thanks to COVID. Um, the debt to GDP ratio uh, in the United States is now over 100%. Um, kind of, it's interesting to try to study this issue in the context of this model I laid out, because actually um, the debt to GDP ratio, in fact, a high debt to GDP ratio, it could be that all it reveals is, is a high, very high demand uh, for, for real money balances. Where again, by money, I mean broadly defined to be include treasury securities. Um, note that the so-called debt in, in our models, that I would argue in reality as well, is, is not really debt in the conventional sense. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really just interest bearing money that's just rolled over. And, and there's no issue of defaulting on it if you don't want to, it's just, especially if it's in nominal terms, the issue is really on what terms will this money be held? What interest rate and what inflation rate? Um, and indeed we know that if R is less than G, and, and here, I'm sorry, I introduced G here. G, little G here is, uh, uh, gamma is the real growth rate of the economy and mu is the inflation rate. So G is the growth rate of nominal GDP. R is the nominal interest rate <coughs> on treasuries. If R is less than G, then we know that a sustainable primary deficit is possible. You don't ever, ever have to pay back the debt in, in that sense. Um, in fact, you can keep on running. Uh, I shouldn't say that. It's not like you ever repay the debt anyways. The debt is always rolled over. The point is, is you can continue to issue it and cause that debt to grow, um, even at the same interest rate and the same inflation rate. And, and this condition, R is less than G, is a condition that's almost always satisfied in the United States. <clears throat> So the, the debt to GDP ratio doesn't cause inflation in this model. It, 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 in fact, it's the, it's the reverse. It's, it's the, the, the inflation rate and the interest rate policy determines the debt to GDP ratio. It's not the other way around. Um, so if we think about modifying the model I just wrote down, and I don't have time to go over the details, but you know, I, everybody here is sufficiently sophisticated to know how we would do this. Um, you know, introducing the model kind of a separate kind of variable that kind of augments the demand for, for outside assets. So the demand for outside assets depends on the real return, depends on stuff, but it also potentially depends on other stuff. Um, it could depend on regulation, it could be a regulatory demand, it could be, uh, uh, it could be a global demand, it could be uh, the, the, an increased uh, need for the security as collateral in, 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 in um, financial markets. But I'm going to introduce this shifter in this demand for money function, basically. And I think there's plenty of anecdotal evidence suggesting that this, sh this shifter has been shifting the demand for U.S. Treasury up in recent decades, right? I mean, we had uh, uh, the growth of, 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 of repo markets in the 1980s uh, was a tremendous source of demand for U.S. Treasury securities as, as collateral. Uh, there's a, been a growing demand for U.S. Treasury securities as a safe store of value in, in, for emerging economies. Um, uh, a big demand for U.S. Treasury securities as a flight to safety vehicle in financial stress. Um, there's been a, uh, an added uh, regulatory demand for this stuff thanks to Dodd-Frank and Basel III regulations. So there's, an ag there's a big, big demand, regulatory demand higher regulatory demand for the uh, treasury securities. And indeed, even more recently, you have all these uh, uh, so-called stable coins that are basically these crypto assets that are like a crypto equivalent of money funds that are, 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 are using US treasuries as security to issue basically money funds. Um, uh, using this uh, these cryptocurrency. So, so there's been, you know, I can, I can give you a lot of anecdotes how globally there's been this great uh, shift in the demand for US treasuries. Question is, if you believe that, and I believe it's true, what are the implications? What does the model say about the implications? So we write down our consolidated government budget constraint, and now I'm going to interpret the tau as the primary deficit divided by uh, GDP. Uh, G is the growth rate of, of, of nominal GDP, uh, and D here is the debt to, to GDP ratio. 
and I've, I've used this little shifter here to, um, to take account of the, of the factors I just described. Um, and so take a look at this equation. And we know how to derive the foundations for D here. Um, whoops, well, I got some data for you. Look at this. Yeah, so uh, deficit to GDP ratio for the United States. You see up until about uh, 2000, or so. I mean, the primary deficit has been, you know, it's, sometimes it's been positive, sometimes negative. Uh, this is a ratio of GDP. Uh, it's really since the financial crisis, you've seen kind of a little bit of a trend up. Uh, but happily, if you take a look at the, the data for the, you know, here's a one-year nominal treasury yield relative to nominal GDP growth, almost always uh, the interest rate is lower than, than G. So R is, R, R is less than G. And in fact, this is also true if you go further back. So if you do, do some arithmetic here, you know, you just take that formula and do some arithmetic. So in the spirit of the title of the talk, do some arithmetic. Uh, you know, if you think about, I don't know, just plug in some numbers, uh, treasury yield of 1%, nominal GDP growth of 4%, I don't know. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio is one. Uh, what does this imply in terms of the deficit to GDP ratio? You see that if, if these conditions hold, the United States should be able to run a deficit to GDP ratio of 3% indefinitely. Uh, and currently that would be about $600 billion, which is not exactly peanuts. And then you can play around with this, uh, right? I mean, suppose, uh, in fact, suppose the debt to GDP ratio goes to two, uh, so doubles. And of course, that'll just double that number. Uh, $1.2 trillion is not an insignificant amount of bond senior, bond senior to be extracting. Um, of course, the big question is like, how high can this debt to GDP ratio go? I mean, that's going to depend on stuff, right? That's going to depend on, on, on the real interest rate. And it's going to depend on other stuff, <laughs> the global demand for this stuff. So it could conceivably go much higher and it could conceivably uh, generate a lot of uh, bond seniorage for the United States that has absolutely no inflationary repercussions uh, or interest rate repercussions. So that's an interesting possibility. Okay, so let me finish with a, a few diagrams and a few experiments here. So this is what I have in mind here. You know, so you, you can look at this model. Actually, I should have probably have it uh, intersect the x-axis here so to accommodate the possibility of primary surpluses, but I just drew it in the region of primary deficits. And so here you've got um, the inflation rate. So I'm holding fixed the nominal interest rate. What else am I holding fixed? I'm holding fixed the nominal interest rate, and I'm just uh, increasing the rate of inflation, mu, the, the rate of treasury issuance. And you can see that the, the treasury would be able to extract bond seniorage up to a point, and then you get the Laffer curve, right? I mean, if it does it at too fast of pace, then, then you, you go down. Um, and so if we start off at point A, you know, the, 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 the US government can be potentially running a persistent primary uh, deficit. And then I ask, what happens if there's an increase in the global demand for these treasuries, a, a shift up, you know, because of that chi thing shifted up, it's gonna shift the Laffer curve up. And then if the Fed and treasury are targeting an inflation rate, the, the only thing that can happen here is for the primary deficit to increase. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's, <laughs> I mean, if it doesn't do that, I mean, the inflation rate's gonna depart from target in the long run. So in fact, this, this increase in the primary deficit is not because the government decided to go willy nilly to spend a bunch of money. It, it did it as kind of implicitly, it sees that there's fiscal space. Inflation would be lo too low otherwise. This is a signal that there's fiscal space so it's able to uh, um, accommodate uh, this, uh, this, this, this inflationary fresh pressure by increasing the primary deficit. And so we move from point A to point B. So you get a world where the debt to GDP ratio is higher and the deficit to GDP ratio is higher, but the inflation rate and the interest rate is, is, is just the same as before. Um, what about understanding lowflation? Let, let's do the same experiment. This is how I, under, I interpret lowflation and also the situation in Japan as well, by the way. So you get um, the same sort of increase in the, in the aggregate demand. Uh, there's a shift in the demand for these, these treasury securities. And if, if, if the fiscal authority doesn't respond to this by, by, by permitting the deficit to expand, 
this is definitely the case in Japan. I mean, you see the Japanese authorities are, are wanting to increase the sales tax. They're very, very cognizant of the growing deficit. And they're trying to, trying to keep a cap on it. But the effect is, is going to be disinflationary. Inflation rates are going to fall. Um, and so, and there's nothing really the Fed can do about this uh, in the long run, at least. And, or, or in a liquidity David, trap I just situation. wanted to let you know that you have five more minutes. Thank you. Um, final diagram uh, is to use this apparatus to kind of uh, ask the question, um, you know, you can have a couple of experiments, you know, what happens if the Biden administration goes crazy and starts to like increase the primary deficit, that's a, that's a, that's a concern. Let me, let me consider a, a, a different uh, scenario that uh, is, is, is also problematic. Imagine that there's some global event that, that causes the demand for U.S. Treasuries to diminish, uh, and who knows what that, what might, that might be, we can talk about it. But this would be the opposite effect, right? This Laffer curve would shift down. So suppose we were initially at an equilibrium at point A, um, you know, what's going to happen here kind of depends on how the fiscal authority responds. If, the, if we want to maintain the uh, inflation rate to target, the fiscal authority is going to have to reduce its primary deficit. The Biden administration is going to have to go into austerity mode. Um, if it doesn't, or if it does so incompletely, there's going to be inflationary pressure. I mean, this is just the unpleasant monetaristic arithmetic. Sorry, I mean, you're going to have to deal with this. The pressure has to be released some, someplace. Either the deficit has to go down or the inflation rate has to go up. And there's precious little that the Fed can do about this in the long run if this, if this situation persists. It could potentially do something in the short run the way Volcker did at tremendous cost. But this is going to be a bit of a, a, an issue to deal with. So let me conclude. Um, conclusion is fiscal monetary coordination matters. The notion of an independent but accountable central bank with an explicit or implicit fiscal support for long run inflation target leaves central bank free to stabilize short run fluctuations in output employment, right? This is a conventional wisdom. Um, but what if we're in for a, a regime shift? Uh, or what if we're in that regime already where, where, the, where the fiscal authority becomes dominant? Um, then uh, the question, and, and suppose either the Biden administration becomes very, very expansionary or there's a collapse in the global demand for US treasuries. The question is, um, well, this is basically the case introduced to us by Sargent and Wallace 40 years ago. And I think it seems uncomfortably applicable to the situation today. My question to all of you is, uh, the, you know, the thorn in Randy's side, they, Randy, how should I advise Jim Bullard on this matter? And, and, and more importantly too, I mean, what is Governor Waller thinking about it? I mean, what is he gonna recommend in this case? So that's my talks. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, David. We're open for questions. Um, if you're here as an attendee, please raise your hand or ask a question in the Q&A and we'll call on you too. David, can I ask a question? So the, your, your, if I understand correctly, the result that the fiscal space is tied to monetary policy is related to the binding reserve requirement. Is it? And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Shenzhen, I was- Can you hear me? Yes, please repeat the question. Um, the, so the the result of the fisc like uh, monetary, uh, I mean the fiscal policy, is going to affect uh, inflation. It depends on the assumption that the reserve requirement is binding. Is it true? No. In okay. fact, it's even uh -huh. stronger if it's slack because if it's I slack, see. then reserves and the composition of the outside assets between reserves and bonds doesn't matter. All that matters for the determination of the price level is the total supply of outside assets. In that mm -hmm. case, the Fed has no control over the total supply of outside assets. That's strictly under fiscal control. So that even makes the case stronger. I see. For fiscal, yeah. David, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so Marco Bassato and I were working on the fiscal theory price level when R is smaller than G. And what we found um, on the, a lot of scenarios, as uh, you said, um, you, you got to have deficit. And, and um, there are a lot of uh, scenario 
even depending on the correlation of uh, government surplus or deficit and and interest rate, uh, you got to have deficit most of the time. Um, but the problem there is uh, we found um, even if you do that, it could be uh, multiple um, uh, equilibrium um, situations. And uh, it all hinge on how monetary and fiscal coordinate uh, to select a particular equilibrium. And I wonder how do you think about that uh, in your model? And um, is there a way, even if R smaller than G, in in general, imply multiple equilibria, but you have a way to select a, a, a particular one that is more favorable. Yes. Yeah, Wei, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And I'm sorry, I haven't seen uh, the paper. You should send it to me. Um, uh, my answer to this is, is, is actually, this is, I'll address this specifically to even to Ricardo because um, in a personal correspondence, R Ricardo says he just doesn't, not, not interested in these types of questions is how I, I interpret it and <laughs> say, the, the, I haven't studied that question in my model, but I should. And the idea is, is this, that, that, you know, is exactly the phenomena you described rears its head. I, I restricted myself to a, a steady state equilibria. So I, I assumed away those issues. But, in, in, but if you study the dynamics, there's a question of whether these equilibria are stable or that if they open up the possibility of multiple trajectories. If they do, and I suspect they do, Ricardo, then what you would want to do is design a feedback rule, an interest rate rule or a fiscal policy rule, a treasury issuance rule, that you get the rule to respond to underlying conditions in the appropriate way to ensure uh, stability. I mean, I think that's, that's a really important question. How, do we, how should the Fed respond to, to whatever in order to, to eliminate the possibility of multiple equilibria? I haven't explored it in this context. I'll be very happy to see what you guys have done. But this is, that would be my answer. I presume you find rules that work better than others. Is that true? Um, we focus more on capital taxation instead of the um, monetary policy, but kind of related, right? You, you try yeah. to target some rates, um, either the rate of return on, on capital or rate of return on, on government bonds. You need some rule out there. Yeah. To, to so for the record, David, just so that since you vent out our private conversations, <laughs> um, I said- I didn't know you were here. <laughs> yeah, I said, I'm not interested in the Taylor principle. Oh, it's I not see. that I'm, I'm not interested in multiple equilibria, I have to resolve them. That's true, I misinterpreted what Ricardo yeah. said. I mean, I think that's, that's you know, uh, multiplicity caused by a silly rule, I'm not interested in. Uh, yeah. Well, but the Taylor principle is an example of a rule. In the context, very... in the context that you have to buy the Taylor rule as either on normative grounds or on positive grounds, and as far as I know, it doesn't really, it's not well founded on either one. So, you know, I'm happy to look at a model with multiplicity and let's think about how to fix it. But I'm not so interested in a model where the rule you put in can cause multiplicity. I mean, it's fine, but um, but about that, since you mentioned dynamics, I'm, my sense is that. Maybe you're throwing out a lot of things the Fed can do by focusing on the steady state. Yeah. So suppose it's like dynamics in the path of G or T in your in your notation. You know, I mean, it's okay. In the steady state, you can control it, but you can do a lot by adapting the path of inflation, Maybe. you know, possibly by smoothing distortions. And that can last a long time. Yeah. Um, so it might, you know, uh, so you cannot control the steady state inflation, but you can do a lot of good or bad by picking the wrong path. In some sense, you know, the present discounted value of the senior age, that's been down. And you have no freedom on that just for the budget constraint. And that's what you're saying. Yeah. But, you know, how you implement that over time can still have, a, you know, just for smoothing reasons, it can be important. That's, oh, that, that's true. But, but, but mind you, I... You could ar ar arguably, I, I did account for that, like in the Volcker disinflation. I, I showed that how Volcker, how the Fed can pin the inflation rate down uh, and keep it down. Um, and, and one of the drawbacks of these models, of course, is the short run is not well defined. I don't know what how long a period is here. Uh, is, it, is it a quarter, two quarters, three quarters? But it's, it's true, even in the model I described, that the, the Fed can conceivably, for a long period of time, unilaterally uh, target the inflation rate, even in, in my simple exp exposition. 
Um, but your more general, your comment applies more generally, I think. In the, is, is the... I think it's more general for the COVID, where arguably the increase in the deficit is temporary, or you could think of it, you know. So in yeah. that case, maybe this uh, high, you know, but whatever you call it, like a high inflation never materializes because then T comes back to the normal level. You know what I'm saying? Just, so, so it's okay not to inflate now and not to anticipate it because later the deficit will get sorted out after we get the, through this. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. David, um, I enjoyed the talk a lot, really. I, um, a lot made me think of a lot of things I've been thinking about in, in a very systematic way. The, I have a very naive question. So, you know, part of the narrative is like Volcker was made a mistake, but the, that, that conclusion relies on fiscal dominance. Uh, so if we make it uh, a regime where he would have had monetary dominance, then, then you would have, uh, you know, had the opposite conclusion, I, I think. So the question I have is like, it seems fundamental to understand whether we live in a world with fiscal dominance or monetary dominance. And the naive question is, you know, how much uh, deficit finance is done by the central bank, like historically? And like, could, you, could, could we track that over time? Yeah, I think people have tried that, right? Uh, and and I, I didn't have enough time to do the lit review here, unfortunately, but, um, but historically, you know, if you look in the United States, at least, you know, it seems like uh, there was a, a broad bipartisan political support for zero deficits, basically, over long periods of time. So there's a, the, the fiscal policy was more or less anchored in that manner. And I, re I recall reading papers that suggested that uh, there was a regime shift in the late 60s. And that, that this might have uh, the fiscal dominance may have reared its head in the late 1960s and the 70s, and this accounts for the the high inflation of that era, and that Volcker reestablished uh, uh, central bank dominance. But there uh, should be a simple account in the in the in the budget, right? That says uh, transfer from the central bank to the federal government. That's all we have to look at, a time series of that relative to the deficit, and that's all. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, in fact, the Fed is remitting record amounts of, 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 of uh, well, revenues. Know, the Treasury, we're, we're remitting something like a hundred billion dollars a year or something, probably since the financial crisis, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 billion. But I don't think that's really, um, I mean, what is your question exactly? Like, is it, uh, I mean, it's so, clear. That so where, my question, very simple is, do we have, any indication if we go through the government's uh, you know budget accounts at the end of the year yeah whether we are in a fiscal regime or in a monetary or, or like in a monetary dominant regime i don't know if one could tell just from the accounts to be uh, honest um well you would know from remittances from the from the fed to the government no but that they may be a byproduct of a, of a monetary authority trying to achieve its its mandate that might just be a, a side product of the monetary authority you know uh, trying to achieve its uh, inflation mandate you know? and so if, if it turns out that we have large remittances for the treasury that's just kind of coincidental. I see, I see. that's your answer so you right. can't tell now I but i mean i have but, but i have no doubt it's the fiscal authority that's ultimately dominant it has David, to David, I have a related question to that. So you would define fiscal dominance basically as saying the long run growth rate of the debt is under the control of the fiscal authority, which I think is put like this, it's obvious, but um, put differently, uh, how much can the co government commit today to borrow in the future? The way I see it, they have just as much commitment power as the Federal Reserve and maybe less. In particular, if the if Volcker could, you know, via punishing the economy, could uh, force, well, could make, could in incentivize the government to change its mu, then I'm not sure I still call that fiscal dominance. So the dominance is as much about the possibility to commit to a mu in the future, as much as it is about doing anything today. Well, that's, I, I agree. I, I, and I think that was the story I tried to tell with the Volcker disinflation. My, my story was that if the if the fiscal authority was resolute enough, there's no sure. way Volcker could have won, uh, but that uh, he inflicted the sufficient pain where they did capitulate. But I was about to say, make no mistake, the fiscal authority is in charge. If for no other reason than the Congress, the fiscal authority 
uh, created the Federal Reserve in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Well, Congress yes. has the power to amend the Federal Reserve Act. It has amended it many times. It's changed our mandates. There's nothing to prevent the administration and Congress from changing that mandate if it wants to. Yeah, there's uh, nothing to prevent it if it wants to, but there is lots to prevent it if, let's say, 40% of the senators do want that, right? So, for example, there's a, there's a practical meaning of they have the ability to, and there is a technical meaning of they have the ability to. In, in a technical sense, they have exactly all of this power you described. In a practical sense, you would have to specify their preferences, the political economy and everything, and taking all that into account, I'm not so sure I would say yeah, that I we live in a fiscally dominant regime. You here, Lucas, maybe Saki. It's not like there's two people in charge and they're playing some you know, matrix game against each other. That's an abstraction that you could think of Sergeant Wallace as being formalized by, but you know, there's a lot of people involved on the decision-making process at the, for monetary policy and fiscal policy, and it's all very some, it's all some very complicated, you know, uh, method or machinery that kicks out different policies. It's, it's not just two two players in a simple game. But on that, let, let me ask this, Dave. So first of all, your narrative is that Volcker was a bad guy. You know, I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. We were on the path for stagflation going up, 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 and he stopped it. Yeah. It was a bit painful. I think I, my personal view why it was painful, I might want to rethink it in light of your presentation. My personal view was uh, he brought down inflation, but people didn't believe it. Yeah. And so anticipated inflation matters a lot for behavior. Inflation expectations were high, but they were overestimating it. And that yeah. caused problems with nominal contracting and all kinds of information theoretic problems. Yeah. So I don't think he was such a bad guy. Oh yeah, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't mean to say he was a bad guy, but but your job. And, but anyway, no, but it's a it's a. He made me become an economist. Yeah, think what damage that's done. But no, no, but that no, but what you do no, but that's a, still the price level is determined by the supply of some money like asset, which the monetarists would say you're only making, among other things, you're making the point that. The control of this money like asset is not simply the choice of the Federal Reserve. Maybe no, but, all the fiscal, but, fiscal policy determines, you know, the, the amount of outstanding nominal government debt, but that still has an impact on the price problem. Is that fair or am I missing something? No, that's fair. No, but, but it's I a mean, completely, I mean, no, it's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair. It's a completely different narrative. Uh, Randy's saying, you know, he, he was successful in bringing down uh, inflation, maybe just by looking at the quantity of money. And you're saying, no, if you look at the unpleasant arithmetic, actually bringing down the quantity of money can be inflationary. That's a, through the open market operations. And it's a completely different uh, narrative. You're saying he made a policy mistake. He wanted to bring inflation down with an open market, with a reverse open market reparation that theoretically is inflationary. And only when the fiscal authority itself and dollar bills are substitutes complements or what and that's a complicated question if you did an open market operation where you took out ten dollar bills and replaced them with twenty dollar bills that would have no implications for the quantity theory so if government bonds and, and treasury bills are substitutes in some sense perfect, sub perfect substitutes yeah, and yeah. Both substitutes so well, what, what do you think so, so, so a question. Forget Volcker. That's about storytelling. You know, I, David seemed to think I was right. I'm, I'm not sure. I, it's even not precise of the statement, but I still think somehow the quantity equation is what's relevant. The question is who controls the quantity, or at least that's one spin on Dave's presentation. Well, I mean, I, I, I said I, I can see how what you said was could hold, but I mean, if so, your your narrative, the one you, that you described of Volcker, is is I can think a conventional one that many of us hold. I, I that's what I I believed as well, until I started reading a bit more about the episode, and I, I think this is really an interesting area to 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 study for all of us. You know, the standard narrative of the inflation of the 1970s, you know, the deficits weren't that big. Wow. Um, there were the two big oil prices, uh, oil price shocks that kind of really mess everything up for that decade. But the, the, the reason is, 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 is this, I mean, the recession was caused in 1981 was basically caused by Volcker's 
hard money policy. I, I think there's no question about that. Um, certainly I felt it, <laughs> but uh, the question is how, how much credit can we assign to Volcker and the Fed in bringing long run inflation down? And I think you're right, Randy, that expected inflation remained high relative to the actual inflation. Now in my model, the actual inflation comes down very quickly, the price level comes down. What happens uh, in the future kind of develop, depends on how people expect monetary and fiscal policy to evolve. Now, one thing that's interesting about that era is that, so my interpretation is this, um, you had Reagan was just elected in 1981. You had this huge recession and this huge expansion in deficits. And I can, I, can, uh, I can point you to newspaper articles where Volcker was complaining with Reagan and Secretary Reagan at the time about how these deficits were gonna be inflationary. And this is why uh, Volcker was raising the rates uh, and, and the economy collapsed. And Reagan and his administration were saying, these things are just temporary. They're not going to be inflationary. My, and, and, and what's interesting is over that period of time, what, you, what I noticed in reading the newspaper accounts is that there, were, there seemed to be broad bipartisan support throughout that period for the US government to do something about the Reagan deficits. And in fact, uh, what I learned was even though, um, even though Reagan's most famous for the tax cut in 1981, um, that uh, over the next eight years in the administration, they basically reversed or increased taxes about 10 times. Okay, so I argue that if, here's the counterfactual, if, if Volcker had not jacked up interest rates the way he did, and prevented the, uh, the severe recession that he caused. My guess is that the broad bipartisan support that was in Congress and the administration to do something about the high deficits would have brought inflation down by itself without the severe recession that Volcker uh, created. That's kind of the, uh, the counterfactual. And that's a sense in which I think, I, I think that Volcker may have made a policy mistake. He ultimately prevailed, but it, was, it came at a big cost and, and arguably the fiscal authority capitulated, but it was on that capitulation path already. Uh, there was no need uh, to, to spur it along that path. So that's the counterfactual. Probably nobody was alive at that time. Just me and you, Randy. <laughs> you know, Wallace was alive. <laughs> I mean, here, here in attendance. <laughs> hey, listen, you know, you took his slot. Originally, he was slotted in for this. Um, oh. you know, he canceled it. He showed up as a. As a you didn't have to tell everybody that. You could have just told me. Well, that. hey, that's pretty good. I mean, it's pretty good being the you know understudy of Neil Wallace as compared to say, I don't know, fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that brings to the end the formal part of the program. A, eh? who's moderator today? Is it Lucas? Yes. Well, I'm the final moderator, Zach, and Sung Sing. That was a pretty good day today. Lots of interesting talks. A lot of fun. <laughs>